Paul Watson's football CV reads like no other in the world. Self-proclaimed failed semi-pro player, he became a writer, podcast host, filmmaker, international manager, top flight club owner, and organizer of a World Football Cup. No, not that one. His wanderlust, love of football, and more than fair share of luck took him to one of the most remote spots in the world, where he managed an international side with very different priorities to those faced by Gareth Southgate. It's the third wettest place in the world, and as a result, the pitch was actually a frog habitat. Pompeii is where two friends are hoping to create an international football team. Following that, he was headhunted to kickstart football in Ulaanbaatar. Paul then became Mongolia's answer to Simon Cowell and helped take his club to their Premier League, where things operate rather differently to the one back home. So then we had to just basically smuggle them out of the country. We had to pay bribe to get them out of the country safely to their country. And all the diplomatic representation said was like, do not deal with these players, they're criminals. A champion of the underdog, Paul's career since has seen him unite communities and use football for the greater good. I love sort of fighting for the lesser nations. Go down to the bottom of the FIFA rankings, find the worst team. And the idea was we were gonna give like hope to young players in Mongolia and make them into stars. And that was, that was the plan. So how does this football explorer see the state of the game? And what can we learn from his globetrotting adventures in terms of how to run a football club? Hello, welcome to another episode of How to Run a Football Club. Now, this is not the first time I've sat down with this man. Paul Watson is to my right here. Paul, it's eight years, more or less, since we first sat down and did a podcast together. I want to dig into all the things that have happened since then. Also, review some of the stuff we talked about previously, because I imagine most of you wouldn't have seen that pod back in the day. Uh, but first and foremost, how are you, my friend? I'm good. I, I can't believe it's been eight years. I know. I'm actually I'm feeling really old now. Well, I mean, that. we just talked about it. The year we did that was 2016. That was the year hashtag was formed. Yeah. We weren't in a league then. I was still playing in the team. Yeah. Things have gone uphill. I think you were saying to me, you know, is it a good idea? I was like, no, terrible. <laughs> exactly. Never going to, never going to take off, mate. Give it up. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's crazy. I can't, actually can't believe it's been that long, but I really enjoyed talking to you then, obviously. Um, and I'm looking forward to our chat today. I, I would like you to describe your journey in your own words, really. I've sort of referred to you as like a football adventurer journeyman in the yeah. literal sense of the word like I mean tell me how you see yourself in the world of football yeah I suppose like a I'm sort of a explorer football explorer like I've gone through um I've gone through a lot of the like less beaten paths in football yeah. um and I, I'm sort of a champion of the underdog I love I love sort of fighting for the lesser nations and um yeah then my career sort of taking me down a load of really weird paths usually basically through chance and yeah. luck um but it's, yeah, it's been a weird career. But you say chance. I mean, it's something I say about our football club a lot is we've had a lot of lucky moments of time that we've pounced on. But you still have to be there. You know, what is it? The luck is preparation meets opportunity or whatever. Like you've asked questions at the right times. Can I do this? Can I come over here? You've done a good job where you've gone. I mean, like, so my understanding, obviously read your book back in the day, all about your time in Pompeii, which is not to be confused with the volcano Pompeii. <laughs> yeah. Probably be an easier job to coach the <laughs> volcano, I'd have thought. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Uh, it would be in Italy, wouldn't it? So it's decent <laughs> be nice, yeah. But uh, no, this is a Micronesian island. I mean, first and foremost, where, where is Micronesia? It's like... It's like it's sort of in the middle of nowhere. It's, it's yeah. almost as far away as you can go from anywhere. And it's like um, four islands make up the Federated States of Micronesia. I was on one of them. And they are separated by really big distances from each other, let alone from the rest of the world. So... The place I usually say is like Manila and like, if you know where Manila is, it's about a few thousand miles. Is it in like Thriller and Manila where they did the... Yeah, Hamid exactly. Yeah. So Philippines. Yeah, um, Philippines. But it's not near anywhere. No. So usually if I'm trying to describe where it is, I'm like, oh, do you know Guam? People look at me completely blank and I'm like, uh oh. <laughs> you played Guam, didn't you? You played Guam in well, game. We, we went you? to Guam on our tour. They were like the nearest FIFA nation right. that we could, we could take on. But yeah, like th this island was totally out of the football world uh, because they can't get access to FIFA. Yeah. So they're even, you know, FIFA has a, has a list that goes all the way to the bottom. And then below that, there are places that aren't even able to get into FIFA. And this is one of those very small number of places. And that was why I ended up there because quite stupidly, we decided, me and my flatmate had decided we were going to play international football. Yeah. And so we were like, go down to the bottom of the FIFA rankings, find the worst team. And at the time, it was Montserrat and Bhutan. Mm. One but, of our players played for Montserrat. Well, yeah. Now, actually, this is way back before Montserrat got a lot better. Like, right. now they've got a lot of really good diaspora UK players. At the time, since, like, 2009, they really didn't have a brilliant squad. But even in there, 
they have people like Rule Fox, if you remember him. Mm-hmm. So I was like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not getting into any team Rule Fox is playing in. So we kept looking and we found this, this list of like non-FIFA football teams, which we didn't know existed. And that was how we found Pompey. Yeah. And it said on their Wikipedia, they are regarded as the worst team in the world because they've never won a single game. Wow. And so we were like, can't play for them. <laughs> can't play for anyone. Yeah. So honestly, it was, only, it was only supposed to be a joke, really, in a way. Like we sent them an, an email to this address and we were like, there you are, done. You know, drunk conversations finished. We'll go about our lives. It's when we got a message back. It was like, I've just moved to London. You know, this guy's sent us an email saying, we've just moved to London. Like my, me and my family, we used to live in Pompeii for 10 years. If you want to meet up, let's meet up and talk about how you're going to play for the country. And we were like, oh. <laughs> and we, we met him and he was like, that you can't play for this country. You'd have to get a passport. It's like impossible yeah, to do to that. There for a amount of time yeah, something. there were a lot of rules. Like we'd have to give up our British citizenship. There were wow. a lot of things. A lot of things that I spoke to my girlfriend at the time, uh, now my wife, and she was like, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. Yeah. Um, but he was like, look, really, we just need a coach. We need someone to come over, rebuild the team, get people playing again. I was like, you know what? I could do that. So how old were so you at did. this point? I was 25. And you played a bit in the sort of semi-pro leagues, hadn't you? I was like a failed semi-pro player. So I'd right. do, what my, I had quite a funny pathway that I would, I'd do a pre-season it, it, at a club and I would actually look all right because back in those days they wouldn't get the footballs out. You remember this was like <laughs> this was like the it feels funny all, to all say fitness. it now, right? It's really funny, but it was just fitness for like at least a couple of weeks of preseason. And I would just get myself so fit. I mean, might not believe it now, but at the time I was like the fittest player on any team. So in preseason, everyone's looking at me they're like, all oh, right, he's a right back. He can run all day. You know, this guy's got got a future. And then the balls had come out, <laughs> and I'd be let go. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't like wow. terrible, terrible, but you know, like sure enough, like players were getting younger and younger players were skinning me in training. I was like, yeah, this is not, this is not happening for so me. So you made your sideways move into management, but yeah. it was like not really, it wasn't something you were looking to do. This opportunity came up. Yeah, by chance. And yeah. then I just, I thought, you know what? Do it. Like do it when you're 25, do it when you don't have kids, have a, a house, like just, yeah, I had a job yeah, so and true. you know, I had, a, I had a job at the time, but I didn't really like it. I wasn't really earning much. I was like, you know what, what's the worst that can happen? And yeah. went there for the best part of two years and it really kind of changed everything in terms of my life, my, my direction. Um, yeah. And I, I never regret two it. Years, and then like for people that don't, and I, I only know about this from reading your book mm. and also, you know, I know you made like a film out there as well. Like, I've seen some of that stuff. Like, from what I can tell, it's a very kind of like almost tropic climate out there. Like you yeah. have frogs on the pitches and stuff like this, didn't you? Like yeah. all the stuff you had to deal with. It's not your classic football, but we, what we're used to in the UK. No. And, and again, like being like a bit young and brash and like seeing all the, all the stuff we could read about it. It's like it said, oh, it's wet. I was like, oh, it's, it's wet in England. Like yeah. we're not going to struggle in the wet. It's the third wettest place in the world. Jeez. So what I did not realize is every day the pitch would just flood and we were there laying out cones. and They're just like swimming away in the water. And I was like... Ah, oh, right. And and as a result, the pitch was actually a frog habitat, like a toad habitat. So you'd have shots and toads would get hit by the ball and they'd go a different direction. It like was the balloon thing with uh, Darren <laughs> it, was, it was mayhem. And um, and the players had been coached like over the years on and off. People had come over and done some coaching. But on the whole, the way they played the sport was just like nothing I'd ever seen. Like people would just be like slide head first in someone's knees. It was madness, but it was amazing. And I was like, you know, I'm going to try and work with this culture rather than like being the british guy that tries to drill him into a boring sam allardyce 442 i was like let's work with what's cool about this that these players are not afraid of anything and they'll yeah. run all day and they were really athletic and acrobatic and i was like we kind of created this weird mixture of like english football and this completely unique island football um what was the aim for you out there because you've gone out there you, you'd become an international coach essentially mm. um was it to win a game was it to you know get them into the fifa rankings like what was the sort of plan you had to be realistic about what you're working with as well didn't you yeah so i i mean the the first and foremost the goal was to win a game because they'd never won and they'd, they'd always been bashed really badly when they played anyone so they lost their last game 16-1 when they oh. went to guam and what it does is it it means anyone who then wants to make this sport their thing is seen as kind of stupid for doing it and anyone who's funded those trips got in trouble because they're like well you've wasted this money on a right. team that got thrashed right. so we had to create a culture where it's like actually these guys can win like we can win a game but the only way we could do that was to to play a game in guam which is like you know 20 years ahead of where we were in terms of their development they're actually in fifa um they got proper facilities that fifa built for them we had nothing we had a pitch that we had to mark out on our hands and knees with rollers and house paint that's the wow. day I got all my skin peeled off because I got sunburnt so badly. Um, like, honestly, we had nothing. We didn't have a mower. We didn't have anything for our pitch. We had to do everything the hard way. 
And um, and so we, we took this team over to Guam and that was our first thing was like, show these guys they can win. Like we trained, like you wouldn't believe how hard we trained. We trained every day um, and to get these kids to believe we could win. But then on the other side, I'm looking at it and going, I don't know if we can win. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, was back before you could watch football from, you know, now I could sit and watch a Guam football game whenever I want, basically. It's probably a live game on somewhere if I want to watch it when Guam, when people are playing in Guam. But at the time, you just couldn't watch it. So we were prepping this team and like telling them to believe in themselves, take them over this tour. And we're like, we could lose 10-0 every game. We had mm. no idea what the, the level was. But our view was like, on the short term, get get people playing, get them out to Guam, get a new generation of leaders for the sport by doing that, show them that this is a proper thing, have them go back and then, then carry on that progress. But also in the same process, show this is a team that isn't in FIFA, is getting no help. And look, they can play and show it to Guam as well and help get hope they'll give us some help. So that yeah. it was kind of a twofold thing. Because it could, it could end up helping a lot of the other nations that, or sort of areas because you can kind of get the best talent. Because would it be that, you know, best case scenario, Pompeii would end up being their own nation or would it be part of Micronesia and that would be a nation? How would it work? Yeah, so it always had to be part of Micronesia and right. that was tricky in itself. So you have the four islands, Pompeii, Yap, Chuk and Koshrai, and they are, as I say, separated by quite big distances and that's always made problems for them in the past. Um, what we had to do then was help them assemble an FA for all of them, where they're all represented in this one FA. Then that could be a nation and that could go into FIFA. So we did, we did manage that. Um, but they just met with brick walls when they were oh. trying to get anywhere. They had visit like site visits cancelled. They just couldn't. They couldn't break through. Um, so that 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 pathway just didn't open up for them yeah. as we wanted to. Um, and weirdly, it's led to me still being involved in football there, even though remotely now. Yeah. And I ended up helping them set up a futsal competition last summer um, for all the four islands for the first time. Oh, so nice. all playing in Pompeii. It was quite nice to go back and sort of see. Is that indoor? Yeah. Helps with the Now that was the move. So <laughs> yeah. this was the move. But at, you know, when you sometimes look back, you're like, what, why didn't we, yeah. what, like, what were we thinking? And then we would, I think we were all just set on football. We didn't realize we could just play futsal. Like yeah. futsal wasn't as big then, I think. It wasn't as known. But yeah, moving it indoors has been a bit of a game changer, literally, because we play on a basketball court yeah. and it's not cancelled for the rain and they can no develop frogs. their skills. There's no frogs. <laughs> so it's it's been so much better. And actually... Because basketball is like a big sport there. All the American sports are quite big there. They really get futsal because it's like more like basketball. You have mm. like, you know, the way the clock works, the way it's like people come in and out. It's, it, it suits better actually in the region. Yeah. But hopefully the two can sort of combine together and, and be like, you know, one helps the other. Yeah, playing a bit more futsal gets them better with their techniques. The same reason the young kids start with like futsal stuff, you know, to get the technical side of the game. And then with a bit of investment and facilities, they can branch out to the 11 side stuff more. But listen, I mean, what's amazing about you is you, we could easily just continue to talk about just the Pompeii project for the rest of this podcast. But there's so much more things you've done, uh, not just since we've spoken, but uh, last spoken, but across your career that I want to dig into. Before we get into some of that other stuff, you have got your own podcast you're doing now, haven't you? Can you tell us about that? Yeah, I do. Thank you. It's called The Sweeper. Uh, it's me and Lee, Lee Wingate. Uh, and we do a podcast about basically the weird and wonderful bits of football that don't get reported on. So, you know, it wouldn't surprise you with my career being in, you know, Micronesia, Mongolia, that I've always gravitated to these underdogs and the crazy stories that come from them. And so what we do is we 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 tell the stories of places you just won't hear about on any other podcast, any other any other football coverage. And um and also just some fun stories in places, you know, Italy, Spain, France, wherever it is, if there's something a little bit weird or quirky going on, we'll we'll tell that story too. Would hashtag United qualify? As a weird and quirky story, are we too mainstream now? You know what? You would qualify if you were in like Italy or Spain. We'd yeah. be like, look, it's this crazy story. But I feel like you're too mainstream too now. To you've, got, you've got too big. <laughs> I'll take it. I'll take it. But look, I love it. It's one of the things I love about football is like, you know, obviously most of the attention, the money is all focused on the top level shiny stuff and all what could happen with things like the Super League. But it is the sport that unites the world, really, even in some of the most far-fetched places that you've been to. Like you never would have gone to if it wasn't yeah. for football, right? And I've I've not gone as far as that, but some of the places I've got to go through football through football as well. I always think of like the month I spent in Russia for the Russia World Cup. Like, would I have ever gone to Russia if it wasn't for that? Probably not. And I had a, it was really eye opening time for me. It's obviously a bit different politically to what Russia is now, but that's what I love about the sport. Really, is, it is core is the way that it unlocks the world, and I think you're such a good example of that. Um, I want to dive into some of the other things you've done as well. But um, before we get into that as well, you're, you're a Bristol City fan, right? Yeah, I am. Yeah, yeah. So there's a recent signing you guys have made I know a little bit about. So you've just signed a guy called Josh Stokes, Joshua Stokes, who was in the same league as Hashtag United last year. 
So we were playing against, mainly competing against a team called AFC Sudbury for first spot. That's the only automatic promotion spot. It's real neck and neck uh, sort of title race. He was their best player, 18 at the time. Super talented, like a uh, winger cuts in from the left on his right foot. And um, ironically, we had a big kind of title deciding game. And he ended up getting sent off in it, which probably <laughs> helped us win the league. And I think he had some big scouts down watching him that day. So it might have oh, okay. slowed his progress down slightly. But in the summer, he ends up getting his move to order Shot. So um, some people watching us or listening to this podcast might have seen that order Shot's FA Cup run this year was pretty impressive. Yeah, it was amazing, yeah. He was a big part of it. I think his stats are something like, I think he's got something like 16 goals from this season already. He's only 19. So you guys have snapped him up. Yeah. So it now means Bristol City have not one, but two players that have played against Hashtag United before. Because you've also got <laughs> Anis Mometi, who uh, was formerly at Wickham. He was also with Woodford Town back in the day, played against us. Uh, and also Bristol just beat my team, West Ham, in the FA Cup, which I'm not very happy about. Yeah, I wasn't going to bring that up. No, I was well, like, that's just, that's just going to make a really awkward atmosphere, isn't it? Well, I hear a lot of good things about Bristol, though. Obviously, clearly... You know, done well across two games in us in the FA Cup, but about the way the clubs run, that the commentators in the game were mentioning it about the way that the because you made a lot of money in transfers, I think recently, and yeah, something's going right there. Well, yes and no. It depends Has it who you talk the to. Pitch, yeah. It really depends who you talk to. So the biggest thing was um, losing Nigel Pearson. So mm. he he was actually very popular, despite the fact that uh, I say despite, but we we got quite stagnant. I feel, and and we weren't clearly moving anywhere fast. But on the other hand, you couldn't blame him because he had worked on like very limited budget. He seemed to be getting the best out of the players. But he basically started to show his frustrations at the fact that, you know, we sold Alex Scott. Yeah, we massive, were trying to get him. I think West Ham ended up obviously at Bournemouth. I was thinking hashtag. I was like, no, wow, no. you, you <laughs> really have him. got a budget. <laughs> no, no, West Ham, well, I'm sure we were in the conversation. But he's, yeah, he's been I mean, a... fantastic player, yeah. like brilliant player. And um, you could tell even watching him. Uh, play you know when you support um a team that aren't in the premier league and you um we, we've very much not been in the premier league my entire life yeah um and we have this is the best we've ever been basically but when you see a player of a certain quality play for you you just know immediately yeah, yeah, like yeah. this kid's special and he's one of those so yeah losing him and just not really investing the money back in and and so yeah when pearson left it was basically with a kind of swipe at the at the board effectively yeah. saying look you're just not putting money back in I think that's what the fans really felt. Are they putting um, it in in other areas like facilities and are they slowly improving the club infrastructure? Yeah, and it's amazing when you go back to Ashton Gate now. So I, I grew up watching us Ashton Gate and um, it was nice enough ground, but it was it was a bit rough around the edges. It was like, you know, it was, it was perfectly average ground, but um, I kind of liked its crappiness yeah. in a weird way. And so now going back there, um, it's fantastic for the club. Like it's, it's a really nice stadium it looks like every bit uh you know top flight stadium in the making um and the facility is great it's a nice experience but it is a bit weird because as i remember football it's much more of a like lower level feel yeah, is what yeah, i remember yeah. in the football growing well, up you would have been at probably um, at a lower level then as well we you? were yeah. we were in and out of what is now uh league one i guess yeah. so we were that was where i kind of grew up watching week in week out season ticket holder at bristol city so yeah it's really weird like it, it it's a feeling with the club that probably the only way forward is more money has to get pumped in. Yeah. But the one thing that has been really good is the stability and the solidity. It's not been like chase the Premier League at all costs or or sell your club to someone who has bad interests or yeah. who's going to get bored in two years' time. So I, I really understand the dynamic with the, the debate within the fan base is like, are we frustrated at being a championship mid-table team? And yeah, I, I guess everyone everyone wants to be a Premier League team. Like that's that's the aspiration. But you look at, but, I mean, certain clubs, it's, it's attainable. You look at what Luton have done and, and other teams as well. And the thing for me is Bristol probably really is the biggest city in the UK to never be in the Premier League or not to be in the Premier League recently. Do you know what I mean? It's like, it should be, a, there should be a team for Bristol in the Premier League. If you look at just geographically, I know there's a lot of misnomers out there. Mm. There's smaller towns that end up being really good at football. Like Blackburn won the league and it's not that big a place at yeah. all. But if you just boil down the biggest cities in the UK, like Bristol is one of them. It is. It's also I've been a two club city, you know, yeah. I hate to admit it, but there are technically two clubs, even if I think we all know there's one really, but <laughs> <laughs> so we are technically two clubs and rugby as well is, yeah. is not, not small. So it is a divided city, but no, I mean, I totally agree in a way. It feels weird. We've never been there. Closest we got was that uh, playoff final when Dean Windus mm. broke our hearts. And Love I literally, Dean. I genuinely, anytime I see a city fan now, like that moment will come up at some point and the look in their face will be the same as mine. That like haunted, I can still visualize that goal. It's beautiful, beautiful goal. So yeah. I've got to admit, brilliant goal. But the fact we were that close to the Premier League and I think 
we kind of knew in a weird way when we lost that game that that, that be a while, that, yeah. Yeah, that I think Bristol moment. City's time will come. I think uh, I don't know the people that run the club, and I don't know everything that goes on there. But from what I can, it's kind of what this podcast is about. It's about right. It's about the running of the club like, off the pitch, and I yeah. think that it seems like the club might not be going in, in the direction the fans want overnight in terms of finishing higher up the league and and, and getting into the Premier League. But I think if you look long term, the clubs that are slowly investing in infrastructure and getting those things right and getting the key appointments off the pitch right, not just managerially, but like, you know, they've obviously got some decent scouting. I, I think Josh Stokes is going to be a top player. You know, is he a championship player? We'll find out now. He's going to get his opportunity. He's actually going to loan back to Aldershot for the rest of the season. So yeah, you won't see him in a Bristol shirt until next year. But um, I, I can see a, a time coming for Bristol in the future. And I think that is the way to do it. You know, look at clubs like Norwich who are getting these sort of lambasted as this yo-yo team. I was like, it's actually not a bad thing to be because I know that every time they go down, yeah. they invest so much, or they sorry, every time they go up and they get that big money, they don't go mad on the transfer kitty and be desperate to stay in the league because it can still go wrong. Remember when Fulham spent 100 mil and still went yeah, down? Yeah, exactly. But they improve their facilities every single time. It's, it's not a bad life as a fan. No. I mean, I'd probably am um, easy for me to say that because I've not seen my club in the top flight, but the, the thought of being like, you know, up there in the championship, fighting for promotion, then in a relegation scrap in the Premier League, it's not, it's Keeps not, you it's not a bad life. Yeah, it's entertaining. It and I mean, I had a lot of that with West Ham in my younger years. You know, we had a couple of relegations, a couple of promotions. Like, it can be, it's fun when you win every week in the Championship. Yeah. Like, we haven't got used to that, really. So. <laughs> Can't imagine that quite. No. <laughs> but I don't want to talk too much about Championship and Premier League. That's not, that, that's not what I've got you on here for. I want to talk about some of the places you've been. So we've talked mm. about Pond Pave, talked about, you know, yeah, super wet area, but also mm. quite warm as well. Yeah. Combine that with what I imagine is a pretty cold place, Mongolia. Yeah, so this was a weird one, and um, you almost couldn't have chosen two different places climate-wise. And so after Micronesia, there was a while where just nothing really happened because I had this weird CV where people were like, "Well, what is that?" Like, yeah, I couldn't really just go and get a job in the English league system. Like when, no when, one's when gonna... you came back, were you like, "I'm a coach now. I want to coach football yeah, teams." Yeah, I, w I wanted to coach, but I had nothing that would hold up as like a qualification for anyone because no one knew where this country was did you have and... qualifications for coaching prior to going to pompeii no like level no, one no, no no i mean i took while i was in pompeii i would come back and i end up just doing first two levels okay so that's all i've got right. i still never went beyond that um fair play to pompeii though for, like the credentials you come up with well i've done some pre-season with, with nothing <laughs> literally nothing but to be honest it wasn't like i got out there and it's like oh, louis van Gaal on the phone or something <laughs> like we had they had nobody and you know it was all voluntary and i didn't get paid anything so it was all very like yeah fair but that did leave me in this weird position where i was like well i want to be a coach but but where'd you go and that was when this mongolia message came in and it came in because the guy who who emailed me enki batsumba had seen a piece about me in Pompeii and was like look we've got a problem in Mongolia that football is just stagnant there is no new there's no like new direction everyone is is just bored of it uh, there was one club that always won the league and they're called uh Urchim Thermo Power Plant number three and they are the, the power plant is it number one but it have, you, what, have you watched if you ever watched the Simpsons Mr Burns episode where he takes a softball team right yeah, and yeah, he, yeah. Uh, it was that basically like they are the football team of an actual so power plant. in the power plant. Well, no, it was like they gave them jobs oh, okay. in the power plant, but they were just like That's Serbian basically what players. happened in the in the origins of, of association football in the UK back in the 1800s. Yeah. They would, when they started to, it was still amateur, but the players would start to be hired by these, you know, like Tet West Ham was Thames Ironworks, oh, right? Okay. So these are factories or whatever would hire this guy and he wouldn't do any work. He'd just play football that. on the weekend. This is like 1880. I can't remember the show. I think it was on ITV. There was a show all about the origins of football, literally how it was invented. Yeah. And it was dramatized and how the FA ended up being created, the FA Cup and all these things. And it covered all that. But I mean, that that's mental. That, so it, it was really similar to that. It's kind of funny to see how it, it reflects itself in Mongolia. Yeah. And like this team being a power plant were government funded. So they had loads of money. They're the only team that had their own stadium, pretty much. All the other teams in the capital certainly had um, to use the national stadium, but they had their own stadium next to this belching um power plant cooling tower wow. and it was just it was crazy so this team were like winning every league every year uh also a lot of games were rigged like it was well really? known a, a lot, lot of games that. were rigged yeah but no one was watching it so the, this team will win in front of like 60 people probably just like a few a few and family we're we talking like um, what time of year is the season happening over there it's very limited because it gets so cold so yeah. season goes pretty much april to September, October, okay. and then it, that's it. How cold and, is it in those months? Um, it's all right. Like it's, right. it's, it's if by English standards, it's fine. Like it's not always cold. The funny thing is, they take the whole month of August off. It's, it's a festival called Nadam, which is like goes back to the um, nomadic days, effectively, where 
they do long distance horse racing, like miles and miles horse racing and archery and like those kind of like events. And everyone goes back to their families and watches these things. So they take the whole month of August off as well within. So the window of football is pretty small. Yeah. And they had this problem that, yeah, no one wanted to watch the league. No one's interested. But what people would watch was English teams. So you go to Lombardo and at crazy times of day, bars would be rammed with the Manchester United fan club of, right. of Lombardo. The, but even the way down to like, there'd be quite strange clubs sometimes. I'd, I'd like chance upon like the Burnley fan club of right. Lombardo or something. I'd be like, wow, this is mad that you're so passionate for this sport. But your national captain can walk down the street and no one will know who that yeah. is. And so that was when I was brought in to start this new football team and the idea was we were gonna give like hope to young players in Mongolia and make them into stars and that was that was the plan what I didn't know was when I took the job which was my first like professional job it was like salary agreed wasn't big uh the currency over there is two rigs and everything is like thousands of it so when I first read I was like oh my god I've made it <laughs> <laughs> currency converted it and I was like uh, okay <laughs> but yeah I got out there and as I arrived, they were like, yeah, there's a small problem. This new team, uh, the sponsors pulled it out. There is no money. And I was just like, oh, I've Did you feel like that? I mean, the cynic in me straight away would be like, was there ever a sponsor? Right, that's exactly what I yeah. thought. And I still, to this day, I still know the guys that, that ran the club and we got on very well, but I still don't know if he right. made it all up. But what, what he did do was I got there and we went for a drink in an Irish pub. There's loads of Irish pubs in Mongolia. Almost all pubs are called Almost, almost everything is called after Genghis Khan because right. he's the most famous Mongol. And over here, he's got a pretty bad rap, mm. but over there, he's like a hero and people like love him. So everything is Genghis Khan, Genghis Khan beer, Genghis Khan vodka, Genghis Khan pub. I sat there in the Genghis Khan pub uh, and Enki, the guy who brought me over there, really like calmly just goes, it's all right, I'll solve it. We're going to do a reality TV show. It'll be like American Idol, but for football. And you're just going to go as the judge and we'll pick these players. And because... We'll, it'll be on TV that you're picking the players that will achieve our goal of making yeah, these guys players. into stars. I was like, this is a brilliant idea. I mean, I was six pints of Genghis, Genghis Khan beer <laughs> at this point. I was like, that's a brilliant idea. But how are you and me going to walk into a TV company and get a TV show? And he's like, yeah, it'd be fine. Sure enough. We spent three days walking, literally just walking into the equivalent of like the BBC or ITV. He'd go up to the front desk and just like talk for a bit in Mongolian, point at me. We get meeting with the commissioner of this channel. So is he well connected, this guy? No, he's, got, he's just got no, he's they brazen. Just they had nothing to do on TV. Yeah. Like, there was just no TV programming or really of any note. So we got it. Like we got this show commissioned within about a week of being there. And suddenly I was like, I was a TV host. Do you think it helped that you were, and I think like it probably is, a, is something that's been laced throughout your career, like as the Englishman. Like yeah. if you didn't have the Englishman, if oh. you were just another Mongolian person, would they have gone no, for it the same no way? No way. It was the English thing. So he'd point at me basically and say, I've got this weird English guy. <laughs> Look at him. And, and like I'd be brought into these meetings where they're talking Mongolian for lit, like 20 minutes. And then he'd translate one sentence. And that was how the production staff talked to me about the show. So they, they would basically talk for about yeah ages. And then he'd just look at me and go, they say you must be like Simon Cowell. And I was like, great okay and, he's like, up. <laughs> and then, he said, then the next thing he said was um but you can't be mean to anyone oh, nobody right. wants that so i was like okay good note good yeah. note simon cow but not mean right and then that was the whole thing was like that it was like you are the english gentleman and but the problem was all the production staff couldn't really speak english yeah i couldn't i could barely speak a word of mongolian so anytime we filmed they would just film me usually it'd be about minus 15 degrees because we started filming in the winter uh and they'd point the camera at me and just go talk and I'd just prattle on until eventually I stopped and they'd be like, good. And so they, we created this TV show Mad, isn't it? where no one could understand what I was saying, basically. <laughs> I just took it. But it's, it must be good. But it kind of worked. We'd turn up to these, le these leisure centres, these futsal courts, and like hundreds of kids would turn up wanting to be part of this team when the word got out. Um, and the, the mixture was really crazy. We, some of them were kids from who come hundreds of miles from nomadic, still nomadic families wow. like, living in the countryside who had heard from like a coach of a coach there's a, there's a chance of getting in this team and it's like a proper team and you'll, you know, you'll be on TV and they're like, wow, they come in. So some of them like literally were, were that. We had a goalkeeper who's a Chelsea fan, funnily enough, who came in from like, yeah, this like semi-nomadic background. He was brilliant. And then playing against him, there'd be a kid and I'd be like, who do you play for? He's like, I've never, never played in the game before. Oh, wow. And then the kid opposite him, I was like, who have you played for? And he's like, oh, Urchin, I play for the, the national champions. <laughs> I was like, why do you want to play for us? He's like, nobody cares about Urchin. Wow, so this mixture was 
weird. It was like you'd have one extreme players that had barely ever played a proper organized game of football. Yeah. And on the other, you'd have somebody plays for like their national under 21s and you're like, it's, it's such, it was such an odd experience. It reminds experience. me a little bit of, because um, we had a previous guest we had on this was Scott Pollock, who we found for our show called The Hashtag Academy, which is basically our version of that. We did a, an apprentice style show to find footballers. Yeah. The first series we did was when we had, uh, we, we were all still in the team. It was quite a low level. So it was a low barrier to entry to who could make our team better. So we didn't know, we, were, we didn't think we were going to find a future professional footballer. We just thought we were going to find some lads that would be decent. And we had some lads turn up like that who weren't particularly decent, but they just loved our videos. And we had Scott Pollock turn up who went pro. We had Adam Lovett turn up who went pro, played for Sutton in League Two, you know, all in the same trial day. But um, that was very much within, uh, you know, we could speak the same language as them. It's probably a bit easier <laughs> than what you guys were doing. So how long did you end up out in Mongolia for? Well, this is the, the weird thing. It took a turn that I didn't expect. So I, I was a coach, you know, that I was just there to coach. And we started off with me, um, like, we picked our team and started coaching it. Uh, we had the sponsorship through a soft drink company who sponsored the channel we were on. So as long as I was drinking this, it was horrible, this soft drink. It was like Lucas Aid had gone off and right. I had to drink it. <laughs> and then that was the sponsorship. Now they pulled out just before we were supposed to start our league season. And I went back to the UK and was like, I can't go back. Like, I can't go back to do this. So I had to leave the team just as we got them to the point where they were going to play in the league. Um, and I thought, well, that's, that's the end of the Mongolia chapter for me. Um, and the crazy thing, I hadn't been paid anything by that point. So I came home and I was like, look, I'm out of pocket, but I just, I just kind of have to move on. And it was only then, um, a couple of years later. So I watched this team. They did uh, all right. They, right. they went up. So they win the second division. They went up. Okay. They then sort of stayed in this first division. And then the whole Mongolian league system collapsed because the federation basically replaced itself and started fresh. And it meant all the corruption that was going on kind of got stamped out a lot. Right. So it was a really good, fresh new start for Mongolian football. And the club at the time had to re-enter and re-entered like in the kind of amateur level because they didn't really have any money. So they were sort of a, a, a small third division club again. And I just, I just couldn't get this place out of my head. I couldn't get Mongolia out of my head. I couldn't get some of the people that we've met out of my head and the, these kids who love this sport, especially this kid called Ochiro who... We met who lived in a year on the outskirts of Ulaanbaatar, which a lot of people do. They, they come in from the countryside. They can't afford to live in building, like proper flat buildings. Yeah. So they just build a year, like in a kind of, I don't know, like a favela town effectively. Yeah. And this kid, Ochiro, he called himself Waza because he was like Wayne Rooney's biggest fan. He'd watch every single Man United game. He'd train at, in minus six degrees in a school wow. gym on his own because they didn't have a football team. I couldn't get these stories out of my head. I was like, these kids, like someone's got to do something, you know, someone's got to really make this club work. So I contacted Enki, the guy who first approached me and I was like, I want to run the club with you. And he was like, no, no, no. Like, you know, you, you don't really want to do that. Like, I'm, I'm sorry. I've never got you your money. Cause that's what he thought I was trying to get was my money, which he never paid. He was like, look, I promise I'll get you the money. I'll, I'll, I'll you know, I'll take it out of my own personal pocket. I was like, no, no, don't give me any money. Just let me run the club with you. And so I became a club co-owner on the spot. And I was like, it was it was really weird because the sums of money we were dealing with were tiny by yeah. UK standards. But suddenly it was as if I was like playing a game of football manager from abroad. I was like, well, let's rebuild our team. Let's so get these kids do, back so you're out. doing this remotely now. You're not, you're yeah. not in Mongolia. Well, yeah. And what would you, so what level were they at, at the time? This so, so then that basically what it meant is that we were in effectively third tier is where we started out. Where would you pitch third tier in this country? That, that team coming from Where they England. were, well, it was really funny. So we, we entered the third tier because that was where it was. The new federation had meant we had to reset everything. So we were basically at the very bottom of the bottom. Third tier is a cup. Um, and so we got our boys back together. Like loads of people from the reality show were like, yeah, we're in, you know, we wanted to play for this club. And then we had a few trials for local kids as well. <laughs> and um, I said... Uh, to Henke, I was like, well, who have we got in the first round of the cup? He's like, Juventus. I was like, wow, that sounds like a tough draw. And he's <laughs> like, I will send you the photo of Juventus. All you right. will not think it's a tough draw. <laughs> <laughs> sure enough, they were like pot-bellied, 55-year-old men. Oh, wow. We beat them, like, I think it was 8-0, eight, eight but we basically stopped trying at half time. So we had to go into the lowest level and we played this amateur cup and won it like really quite easily. Yeah. And then that allowed us to get into what was effectively the proper second division, which is a league system. And that was a lot more competitive because you'd have teams that were like the company teams of businesses. So like Continental Tires had a, a team and they were pretty decent and okay. they actually paid their players, whereas we were basically just paying tiny little amounts. But, you know, with us, it was more like 
we would help players with things like their transport costs yeah. and stuff like that. But we were basically amateur. So if you're going off budget then and you're going off say, second tier Mongolian football, yeah. you're, you're probably looking at like low level Saturday football in this country, right? Would you say that's fair? Like yeah, I, th I, th I think that is fair. And, I, and in terms of the amounts of finance that club ran for, we ran the whole club on about £2,000 yeah. for, for a year. And that's that, amazing. I mean, that's the craziness of it. But what happened to us really was we did not expect this to happen. So we we set ourselves up and we we're like, look, this is our plan. We just sit in this division. We we train up young local coaches. We get them their badges. We encourage local kids to come out and play, especially kids who perhaps don't have access to football. And this was our whole like model. And we did this in the second division. And we finished fourth, I think, in the in second division. It was fine. You know, 12 teams in there were like fourth, fine. But that meant we were in the playoffs. And we're like, okay, we're in the playoffs. Do we actually want to go up? Because yeah. if you go up to that top division, even at that time in Mongolia, it was starting to be a lot of clubs that were not being run in a particularly like responsible way. Right. But they were chucking money around by Mongolian standards. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. You're not looking. But they were spending in a, a player would earn in a month what we were running the whole club on wow. a year. Wow. So we were like, we can't really yeah, go up. Crazy, yeah. So we ended up in this web position where we're in the playoffs. Um, and we got into the playoff final. We won the set. We got, got to the playoff final. And we're like, do we really want to win this game? And I'm watching remotely still at this point for the first leg. Um, it's two legs, both, but they're both played at the national stadium. So I watched the first leg remotely, um, and it's a draw. I think it was, I can't even remember. I think it was three all at the time. And I was like, okay, that, that you know, that's fine. That, that that's a great game. Like it's good, but are we a bit worried we might go up? And we're like having conversations behind the scenes. Like, I, hope, I kind of hope we don't go up. Then we go to I get, I get to Mongolia. We go second leg. Again at the national stadium, and it's it's kind of like late on, in the late stage of the game, um, it, it's to all. And the weird thing is that it's going towards penalty shootout, I think. But the final whistle goes, and both sets of players think they've won on away goals because oh no one gosh. knows which one was the away leg. <laughs> so our the same players, anyway. yeah, our players are celebrating. Their players are celebrating. So that means each team would probably been playing like to to end the game at that score. Right, they weren't trying to attack. And this is the weirdest thing is that we're like we're like well how does no one know? Like, was no one aware of which leg is which? And we were going to see officials. We're like, are we up? Are we not up? And we're just like, I don't know. And we weren't up. It uh -huh. turned out that we had lost out. Wow. But we were just massively relieved, the owners, but the yeah. players were gutted. They were like, you know, we, we, we lost. Is um, there not a world though where you could have won the competition and then asked to not go up and they could well, have gone up anyway? this is the crazy end of the story, right? Is So we, we do all that. We're like, fine, you know, rebuild for next year, guys. We're, secretly happy and then we get the message that the team that had won the league so not the playoff team had refused their place in the premier league wow but our message that came to us was not you can take this or you can leave it it was you can either get promoted to the premier league or you get relegated because that's okay. what they did to the other team if you don't take your oh place in the division gosh, you get relegated mad. they were like it ruins the integrity of the sport and we're like what did you do we had to take it you went up but, with, <laughs> but by this time, this had rankled on. So they only refused their place about three and a half weeks before the season was supposed to start. Jeez, it's crazy. We had, we basically had to take it. We, we thought we had to take it. Also, I think we were going to get fined. We you also had to go in with it. the same squad. You wouldn't have had time to build the new yeah, squad for the new We had division. no squad. But the worst thing we had was both our coaches didn't have the, the badges required to be in the Premier League. Gosh. They were fine. That's weird. So we had to find a new coach who had a, a, a license. Otherwise, we weren't allowed. We had to find some, some players to flesh us out and box us out. And we're suddenly playing against teams that are owned by like these petrol oligarchs. One of them was like the son of like a, a petrol billionaire had given this club to his son as a kind of toy. And so his son was just like paying people three grand a week, all the players three grand a week, four grand a week, whatever they wanted, and just like throwing his weight around, signing players. And we're there like, we don't have any money. Yeah. Like we have total maybe £5,000 for the season. Jeez. And that was our situation. We ended up in this absolutely mad situation where we had 10 days basically to properly get ready for the season. I'm guessing that it was, it was not a successful season on the pitch. <laughs> it was not a successful <laughs> no. season. But the amazing thing that did happen is we got a coach. We advertised, as with all great clubs, I advertised on Twitter saying basically, can anyone come and coach us? Season starts next week. We got loads of applicants. But one applicant was amazing. The CV was just insanely good. Um, he'd worked with like Roberto Martinez. He was, like, oh, was wow. like, wow, this is a good coach. He's called Shadab Iftika. And this this CV came came in. And I was like, this is amazing. Like, Did I've, you know, I've, I'm guessing the position was like 
unpaid or very low pay. It was it, no, we did have sal- we had a okay. salary to pay. It was not great. It was pretty bad. So I phoned him up, and he was in the car park at ASDA in Preston, and I was like, <laughs> and he was talking to me. I was like, I was almost trying to talk him out of the job because I was like, we have no money. We are going to get thrashed. You, you do you really want to do this? Like your CV's amazing. Why do you want to do this? And he was just like, honestly, it's really hard to get jobs with with my name. It, it's racism. It's a wow. really hard structural thing because he is a Muslim, because he's Pakistani heritage. Like he said, like opportunities do not come along. And he was like, he basically knew my club better than I did at the interview. He was like, wow. I know exactly what I'm going to do if I come in. Just just let me do it. And I said that salary was, and he was like, I'll do it. I was like, are you sure? And he's like, yeah. Can you have a little think about the salary and maybe just come back to me if there's any chance you can pay a bit more? Phoned him back. I was like, there really isn't. He's like, God, you're a hard negotiator. I was like, no, we just <laughs> literally have, have no money. money. <laughs> and he was on the next flight. He flew, he, he got, went from Preston to Ulaanbaatar in time for our second game. We didn't get him in time for the first game where we got bashed. And he did an amazing job that season. Like we did, we barely won any games. We won, I think twice, maybe, maybe once, but he, he did such wonders for that team and keeping us like competitive. And um, he was like, yeah, it was incredible watching him work because he was obviously so te- technically and tactically astute. And he was like one of these guys who works like 12 hour mm. days, if not more. And he would watch every moment of every game, every team we were playing. Uh, and I was in, in and out of Mongolia. Um, but often when I was in the UK, he would just phone me at like 3 a.m. I'd be like, oh God, what's happened? And he's like, I know exactly how to stop Hong Hom's right winger. I'd be like, <laughs> great, mate. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you want them, you want your manager to be like that. obsessed with the game yeah. amazing kid like amazing guy young coach learned his trade on football manager like, wow and then you hear about that more and more now yeah is it, um, and and basically his way of getting in was he stood outside i think it was wigan's training ground um until roberto martinez would talk to him and let him do a scouting report and it was so good that he was like you can do me another one and it just carried on so he yeah. became like his kind that. of guru and so, yeah, since, since, since buying goal, which was probably the low point of his career, but, um, so he, when something he, like that happens and there's not a lot of money for the coach, would you provide them with like somewhere to live and things like that? Yeah, yeah we did. It was, it was a terrible, um, it was probably a terrible apartment by UK standards. It was pretty much the one that I lived in when I was there. Right. They're very like Russian style, high rise buildings. Um, and he, he joked and called it the only fools and horses apartment because it was that kind <laughs> yeah, of like, yeah, yeah. but so was the one I lived in. So the one that I lived in, um, if you plugged two things in one of the plug sockets, it would just give you a little electric shock. Yeah. Uh, and so I was just like, this cannot be right. But it, it, it was fine. And it was warm, at least in in like in the colder months. But yeah, like it was, he was on so little really. And we had so little. And it was, everything was just like, just like grabbing what little we could to keep this club running. And it was all just because these kids loved it and believed in it and were proud to play for them. And they just, their other clubs weren't like that. The other clubs would bring in players like um, like for a few months from abroad. They'd win the league with them and then they'd just cycle them through and cycle yeah. them through. So young kids were just not getting a chance anywhere else. And so we kind of really felt like we had a mission. Yeah. Um, and and you, did, you did some great things, right? I mean, didn't you bring a player over from, is it from Mongolia, the player you brought over to Barnet, was it? Or you wanted to get him a trial there? Yeah, so that was great. He wasn't actually one of our players, but we, oh, we okay. never wanted to be... Um, like factional and like you know tribal about it we were like look one of the biggest problems for players here is they don't have a chance to like experience other ways of playing and other styles and like test themselves so we said to the federation that we want to bring out two players and a coach from mongolia to the uk um and we'll give them an experience with the uk club and just you know they'll take that back with them and it'll be it'll be kind of massive for their development and um there was a lot of like backwards and forwards but in the end we brought back uh we brought over one kid who was amazing called gambled gambaya who was like their star player who was like 16 i think at the time and he was their like biggest hope is he playing in the national team and stuff like that would he, yeah would he so do? at the time he was like in their youth right. setup he played for hom hom that team that i said before um but we we didn't care like we just wanted the kid to have a good experience so i managed to broker for him to go to Barnet for for the summer all of them in fact him and a slightly older player and the coach uh Tulga, who was like the coach of Urchim actually at the time uh and so they all came over and just they had the most amazing experience they got we got them an Airbnb in Edgware which I uh 
I actually ended up paying for that because the Federation just never paid me. But I was like, there's a running theme here. Yeah, right. I was like, no, I expected that. <laughs> um, and it was quite funny because I was booking this this Airbnb in Edgware and the, the woman who owned it was like, so, you know, I hope you have a nice time. And I was like, oh, it's actually, it's, it's, uh, I'm getting this for three Mongolians. And she's just like, I don't ask any questions. I was like, like no, 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 it's not weird. It's, it's just three Mongolians. But yeah, they, they loved it. And and Gam, Gambaya, like he had this incredible spell and he played for... Because he was just supposed to train for, with Barnet, like it wasn't there wasn't any like obligation on their side, but he was really good. So they started to put him in their under sixteens, and he scored like quite a few goals. He put up some assists. The ones that I remember are he scored past Jose Mourinho's son, who was playing in goal for oh, Fulham yeah. at the time, um, and he was just brilliant. And it was such an experience for this kid because you could see him growing with each, yeah, each yeah, yeah. but also with, for the coach coming over and just seeing how a, a professional set up in this country they were. League Two at the time, Barnet. Yeah. But just to see what that looks like compared to back in Mongolia, it's, it, it was you could see the cogs where you could see like he's thinking, oh, this is how we should be doing things like yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. And so that impact that month, uh, it was a month and a bit had on on him was amazing. And then Gamba signed for uh, Pushkas Academia in Hungary and became like the first um, European professional. Uh, well, professional Mongolian to play in Europe. Wow. Um, and he's still in their national team now. He's like one of their best players. So that experience for me was like, we, we really did like something good there. Yeah. Um, and it, it was a it was a strange way for it to have all happened. But but we we did that and said, look, if if anyone else wants to do this kind of thing, we we can do it. But um but the other thing that we were doing at the time, which was very really difficult, is we we had to deal with a lot of um there was a lot of player trafficking in Mongolia. So this was a right. big thing. Right. Players would come in from Africa, be told they'd be given a certain salary and they just wouldn't pay it and they wouldn't get them their immigration status. So they were illegal immigrants. And these players then... Why would someone do stuck. that? Get them over and then they, they take a look at them and they don't want to pay them anymore? No, it? well, that was... So, yeah, so they either discard them. But what, what one of the teams did, um, and this, this is really bad, they were quite a big team. They're in like Asian competitions. They brought over two players... And we didn't realize we we saw them sleeping in the park rough. Like Mongolia is not a good place to sleep in the park rough. So we came across these lads and we're like, well, "What are you doing sleeping here?" And they're like, "Well, look, the club brought us over, and as part of the deal, um, they were going to pay us this salary, and and it was like fine, like it's totally fine salary. But what the club did then was they said, "Ah, oh, your visa got rejected. You keep playing for us, but this is your new salary. While we pay this, this money is going to go to the admin of us working out your immigration right. status." And they had nowhere to go because they're illegal immigrants. If they're they allowed, went to the police, they were still allowed to play in the league, though. It's not like a well. This though. is the thing: they weren't, but ah. the club weren't letting on to the uh, FA that they were illegal immigrants right. now, because otherwise they would have been banned. So these players' salaries were just cut and cut, and they couldn't afford their apartment, so they were living rough. And these players were like, "Look, can we can we sign for your club? Because you know it seems like you're decent people." And we're like, "Yeah, but the problem is like you're illegal immigrants. We won't be allowed to sign." They look, like, they were like, "Look, we just want to go home." So so what we did was we signed them didn't really sign them in any real sense we put them into our squad let them train with us we put them up in a house with with our players um we told the club that they had been playing for look we know what you've done we're going to report this to the league report it to the league and the league said oh it's terrible they're banned now they can't play football and that's all they did they banned the players banned the players just said yeah no not at all just said those players are banned not that we ever we knew that would happen the players knew that would happen so then we had to just basically smuggle them out of the country we had to pay bribe to get them out of the country safely to their country and that was all we could do we tried to contact diplomatic representation we tried all sorts of stuff we're like look this is our situation and all the diplomatic representation said was like do not deal with these players they're criminals and i was like they're not criminals they are they're kids who have been tricked and so yeah we paid a, a bribe to get them out of the country and actually that bribe was all that was left of our budget basically so when we when we came bottom of that league that year we had blown through all our money and we'd just experienced like how grubby football at that mm. level could be. Mm. And we could see these clubs succeeding and like winning things, treating players like that. Yeah. And we were just like, we don't want to do that. We want to be a youth team now, but we don't want to get involved in that. Yeah. That mess. It's amazing what competition or it's not even competition. It's the ego, isn't it? It's the ego of these guys that run these clubs in any, clearly in any country in the world, you know, Outer Mongolia is used as the thing yeah. like in common parlance, isn't it? Like the furthest place yeah. you can go. But even there, or in Mongolia, whatever, um, the same stuff's happening. You know, we see it in non-league all the time. It is, it is, it is always comes back to ego. 
whoever runs these clubs, they want, for whatever reason, whatever sort of thirst in their soul they need to quench with football, and they uh, and they will do anything to get it. And it's yeah. that's just, I'm saying, I'm a fair play to you, by the way, for doing that, for those guys. I think, for me, that's one of the things that has allowed me to, um, I wouldn't say cap my ambition, but has allowed me to focus more on the sustainability side of hashtag and not be kind of like bedazzled by the, the bright lights of, of professional football or whatever we could take hashtag to. Like, and you mm. could argue with the finances we have short term, at least we could probably do that. But long term, there'd be no hashtag. We'd run out of money. And would you be doing it just because I want to? Like, we, it wouldn't exactly. be the actual logic to it's it. It's like, where are you helping? Yeah. And- Exactly. And and I, it's interesting what you said about youth football as well, because that's something I find, like, the younger guys, it is it is a bit more rewarding, I think, sometimes, because you're helping people get from A to B. I think our version of that is when we have a player that we know can play higher level and we can be that platform for them and then send them on their way and go and watch what they do, which has happened a number of times. It's another reason I love the women's game as well, because I think that there's still elements of that, of course, but there is less ego involved. I think with the players, they're still more appreciative of opportunities because they can remember a time when there just was nothing in women's football and it's growing. So it's a much more kind of, uh, it's a bit more gratification instantly just for doing things for the right reasons than you get in men's football. Sometimes it is a un- unfortunate kind of negative correlation. Like the, the nicer you run your club, the worse you will be on the pitch. It, yeah. It is as simple as that in a yeah. way, isn't it? But like for me, I always felt like if anyone who ever comes through a team that, that I'm in charge of, like I, I feel like I have, I have a duty of care for that person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for me, it was always like, these guys are, uh, are buying goal guys. Um, if something goes wrong, if the buck stops somewhere, it stops with me. Like, it was always that. It's like, if their wages are not being paid, in the end, it comes back to me as a yeah. co-owner of a club. That is my money that's going on the line there. And I don't have a lot of money. <laughs> After Micronesia, I certainly yeah. didn't have a lot of money. So <laughs> it was always that for me. It was like, the stop, the stop, is me. I am yeah. the backstop. I take that responsibility. And there is no world in which I leave people out on the limb. But sadly, that did make that club untenable in that yeah. in that level. Of and some people would tell you that means it was not a successful project because they're only judging it on, you know, where did you finish or whatever. But not only did you get them to that level, you also did some things which some of them won't have been evident on the pitch that are really important things. You know what I mean? So that's why I think people's... Uh, you know, this, this podcast is about running a club, but it's also about like almost creating the just the, the the definition of what running a club is, because it isn't just winning on the football pitch. You know, there's a lot of things you can do in a football team in a community with people's lives that are amazing that your competition might never care about. The people that don't support your club will never see it, but it's still really important work. I mean, there's loads more I want to talk to you about. I want to talk about Kanifa as well, but first thing that comes to mind when I hear about your story, and there's a lot of it. Like, if I hadn't had hashtag kind of keeping me around doing what we've been doing the last eight years there's so much of it that i would have loved to do like my own version of to be honest and i'll mm. see where i could have used my youtube channel to if i could have found some, do essentially the same thing you did and being like right i'm going to come with my camera and i'm going to come and film the journey what what job can i get for you in your country or whatever i would love to do it the first thing that comes to my mind when i think about that is how did your missus part with it <laughs> like how did you get away with it i oh, know it's at this point i told you i got divorced isn't it <laughs> no she's she's amazing i think i think the thing was so when it first happened you know we've been together quite a while but i was 25 she was 25 and i think it was this this feeling of like look if you don't do these things yeah you're just here and eventually that's a kind of almost like a resentment built with this. It's yeah. like, you know, you, you're being kept back from your your destiny almost. It sounds a bit cheesy, but... And I think after I did Micronesia and came back, the harder one was Mongolia. Right. Because it was like, I'd done it, but I was looking and thinking, you, you don't necessarily like build your career with the reality in mind, if that mm. makes any sense. So I'd always had this vision of like, when I wanted to be a player, it was just, oh, I want to play football. And then it was like, as a coach, I was like, what kind of coach do I want to be? And obviously I love travel and I love experiencing different things. So I guess in my mind, I had this vision where it's like, oh, maybe I'll be Mongolia one one job. Next job might be like, I don't know, like Thailand. And yeah. then maybe the next week. And I, and I know coaches like this and they're amazing people. It's incredible they can do it. But what I never really factored in is like, how do you have a personal life? How do you have a yeah, relationship, yeah. let alone a family? And the sacrifices that must take. So I think Mongolia was a really big moment because I ran into that and I was like, wait a minute, is this what my life will be now? Yeah. And I think she probably was thinking that too. And it was like, in a weird way, the fact that 
collapsed and then I became this owner role where I could dictate and be like, well, look, most of this role is remote. Most yeah. of what I can bring to this club is, is strategy and direction and, um, and, and sort of, yeah, like that doesn't require me to be physically in Mongolia as much. I can pick and choose my moments. In a way then it was like, oh, that works with our lifestyle. But it was by chance that ever happened because I I was just thinking I was a coach and then suddenly this ownership thing came in. I was like, actually, I kept getting into this, like as a, as a player, you're focused, you know, obviously you're focused on your team and your teammates, but you focus on you a lot. And then as a coach, you're focused on your, your group and yeah. but it's very much on the pitch. And then suddenly I was like, I quite enjoy looking at this and like, I'm looking at sponsorships. I'm looking mm. at like shirt sales. And I'm like, how, how is this all working? I was like, maybe I'm not a coach. Maybe I'm something else. I don't know quite what it is. Is it a club owner? Is it an organizer? Is it whatever that word is? But it was quite a relief because I was like, I don't have to work this out within the confines of my relationship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I, I, I see coaches now and I'm like, I see them posting like really good coaches who are posting on social media saying, you know, excited to go back to my job, gutted I won't see my kids for the yeah, next yeah, few it's months. True, true. And you're like, wow. And that's living in the same country. Even me, yeah. like, because I still go to a lot of our games. And, well, I go to every game I can. And because we've got a women's team as well, that means Saturday and Sundays are taken up. So yeah. even just being local, I was still like my little boy is only three, but when he gets older and he starts playing football, for example, if he does, I I basically won't be able to be there. Like I won't be able to be at his games, and that's quite a big decision for me because my dad was always there to watch me, yeah. and it's part of the reason I probably liked it. So, do you want to by being such a kind of by having football such a big part of your life, it actually negates it being a part you being a part of your son's footballing life or your children's right. footballing life. So I think I can only, uh, yeah, fair play. I think once you got through Micronesia and you, it's all, it, the relationship was intact, you're like, okay, she's a keeper. <laughs> yeah, no, for <laughs> you know sure. I mean? It's for amazing. Sure. It's amazing. But, but I, I think what you said is that that's a really interesting part of football is that we all go into it as, by nature, we go into it as kids and then we stay in it when we're like, you know, becoming adults. But we don't have responsibilities. We don't have to think about like, what am I going to want to do on 40? What am I going to do with 50 or yeah. whatever? But this is a sport that demands weekends every weekend pretty much through yeah, the year yeah. and it demands midweek nights and it demands you know the demands of this sport are really antisocial. yeah there is no nine to five job in in in, in really yeah, there's barely any in family football, like. people because you're you're basically your time off is when the kids will be at school right like, so there's no there's no marrying up there but i think um yeah i think people that make it work i always look at the three sort of versions of careers in football you got Playing, which is the hardest because it's so competitive and it's the shortest career. Mm. And so in many ways, you do get players that can do that and then sort of be family men after they retire. Mm. Then you've got coaching, which is a longer career, but is very short term in the sense of you could lose a game and get sacked. There's no security there. But, right? And you could have to move your family yes. overnight, the length of the country, or you're moving on your own and leaving your family. Like, yeah, that, it, that's, that's tough. normal, right? That's, that's tough. Yeah, that's, that's a big commitment. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and then you've got what you're sort of talking about is the sort of executive roles in football, which are probably the most balanced in terms of what you can do. Um, you can work in these days, you can work remotely. You can not need to go to games even, even though you might want to. You can sort of build your career around it. Um, but they're the furthest from the pitch. And I, I, as a result of that, they're kind of the long term, most long term in your thinking. So like for me, when I'm running hashtag, I'm thinking really like years ahead at any point. So what that means is that of course, I go to a game and I want us to win, but every loss is nowhere near as damaging as it would be for a manager or a player because it's all about the season and it's not even really about season. It's about a period of seasons. Like we had a five-year plan to get to the leagues we're now in, which we did in four seasons, really. Like now I've got the next five-year plan. It's like I'm always thinking, okay, what does this sponsorship deal do for us over the next 12 months, 18 months? And I think maybe I do prefer that because it is, it's a little bit more in your own control. Like when COVID came along, that did kind of just all bets were off. And it was like, well, we actually can't do anything. Yeah. But apart from disasters like that, as long as you've got a plan, and you go, okay, I'm going to get this sponsor. We're so content driven at our club. So it's like we can genuinely impact the pitch by making some good content. It can help get a good sponsor from it and vice versa. So I feel a bit more in control about it. Like I always remember that quote Steve Jobs said, which is, uh, I don't know if it's a quote or if it's a paraphrase, it's in the film. But obviously, like Mike Wozniak, who was like the, the, the tech guy behind the Apple iPhones and invented everything. And he was really, they were kind of like, why isn't he running the show? Because he's the genius. And he's like, Mike plays the piano. I play, I play the orchestra. Steve right. Jobs is like, you know, he's a conductor. He controls every part of it. And that's what I feel as an owner or whatever. Yeah. You do it, a football club, it's being able to control the characters that control what happens on the pitch, you know? Exactly. And that's when you're a good owner. Yeah. Because that's what I always thought 
is the mark of a bad owner is you're trying to get involved in the things that are not your thing. So if you're an owner and you're trying to impact pitch like team selection, that's that's not good ownership exactly, yeah, because yeah, yeah. your job is not that. Your job is to sit above and to empower people in different parts of your club yeah. to do their work, right? So that I always think that's a really telling thing is I get I get why owners still want to be on the sideline. They want it because that's why we all go into football. Yeah. I, I sometimes feel like I miss football. It's really weird. My life is football, but I miss being at games. I miss playing games. Like, because so much of what you do is football related, but it's not literally involved in a game or football. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I get why owners want to be like that. But that's the sign of a bad owner for me is when you're starting to really interfere, even interfering with the coach. You know, yeah. if you want to sack a coach, that's that's a matter of discussion. But if you start trying to impact on what that coach is doing, you are you are not doing that the right way. Your job is you you are supposed to be a level removed from that. Exactly. And I think that's happened so much. Do you remember the famous QPR documentary? If now it's called the Five Year Plan, actually, oh. and it was um, the owner of the time literally went down on the bench with Ian Dowie and was telling him what to, who to sub on <gasps> and sub off. And you're just like, he's an Italian guy. I can't think of his name. Was it but, Flavio um, Briatore? It might have been. Yeah. yeah. It was before the, Tony Fernandez bought the club, wasn't it? After yeah. That. It was before his era. Maybe, yeah. But I mean. um, yeah, you're just like it's all. Co- it's one of the best documentaries. Like people love the Sunderland one because it's kind of everything's going wrong this yeah. is like that to the power of five <laughs> like it's amazing stuff but but so so if anyone uh that's watched hashtag for a while may remember just before we went into non-league i had this idea it came shortly after when i was trying to kind of like yourself when you wanted to see if you could you and your friend could play international football i was trying to work out if i could make hashtag actually a country <laughs> <laughs> I was like Googling, like, how do you become a country? Can we buy some land somewhere? And like, you know, is there a workaround? And that turned out to be quite challenging. So then I was like, right, the next thing is, because you've got to remember my mindset at the time. We just played friendlies, right? Yeah. And we'd kind of, kind of like completed that. We'd, we'd had this sort of exhibition division system, which we created, which we won. And we made it a challenge, but we won it. Um, non-league was an option, but it wasn't, we weren't ready for it yet. There was a bit of time we had to wait. So what could we do in the middle? And I was like, well, okay, we can't be a country, but can we beat a country? Mm. And again, it's, it's going to be pretty complicated for us to you know, just arrange a friendly with... Italy. Well, <laughs> I was thinking like that. Gibraltar at some point. <laughs> okay, now, yeah. But even then, you know, I think maybe we'd give Gibraltar a good game now, now, but then we wouldn't have been anywhere near ready. But um, but then I found out about Kanifa. I think mm. it's probably for yourself, actually. Mm. So confederations of non... <laughs> yeah, it? I was. This was my nightmare for so many years when I was working for them. Confederation of Independent Football Associations. Okay, yeah, so it's CON, it's from Confederation. Yeah. yeah. Confederation of, of Independent Football Associations. So these are not necessarily countries by the kind of geographical definition of the term, but mm. a lot of them there. I mean, how would you describe Yeah, it's yeah. really tough to describe. So uh, I guess nations, states, and peoples okay. not recognized by FIFA. So what, what it provides is a space for people to express identities that are not currently within the FIFA system. And that, that sounds quite vague, but that's because they can vary massively. Like it can be all the way through from Tibet, which is a very easy one for people to understand. You know, everyone knows pretty much everyone knows about Tibet. Yeah. Um, in the eyes of FIFA, a Tibetan place for China. Well, that's not right. going to work. So where is the home for Tibet? Well, that that's what Conifa provides, you yeah. know, non-FIFA football. But it can also go all through to regional identities, linguistic identities, and mm. that's where it gets a bit more challenging. Someone like Catalonia or Catalonia, that would that cl- yeah, they, they would they would qualify. They'd be pretty they good, would right? qualify. Sometimes they have actual Spanish internationals play. For yeah, them, the they? reason they can't play, there's a really funny technicality with them. So they are only allowed to play in a really set window by the Spanish FA. Right. Otherwise, all those players would not. I think not be allowed to play in the Spanish league system anymore. Oh, I see. Like it's, it's sort like a of they, yeah. So they play like a few exhibition games every year, and they're they're really good. Yeah, because I know that um, like I think like uh, people like uh, Pep Guardiola has played for them back in his playing days. Yeah, like, any of those sort of Barcelona crew that are from that area. Yeah, and they'll play against like Venezuela or like something like that in a yeah. friendly, and they'll they'll do pretty well. Like they're they but they yeah they would fit in Canifa technically. It's that idea. It's the idea of identities that are denied, but but. It means quite a few of the teams come from persecuted peoples or people who've had their identity taken away. Yeah. But on the other hand, yeah, you'd have slightly more unusual ones in there. Like Cornwall, for example, is in there because it has a, has a language. Kerno is 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 like, you know, a linguistic identity. And it has a very like proud history of independence too, Cornwall, in the past, you know, if you go back. So would that team then have... Uh, would- would Kanifa, as a as a, conf- as a federation, mm. would they place rules on how a player can qualify for Cornwall? Like, would or Cornwall decide that themselves? Or you you've lived in Cornwall for a year that you qualify? Or what, yeah. You know so I mean? this was always a, this was always an area of contention. I'm saying um, I'm prepared to drive to Cornwall to get a call up. 
<laughs> I'll put you in touch with them. Um, I've got some family that live there. So. It, the, it depends. So it is up to each entity to set their own rules. Right. And that obviously has drawbacks. And those drawbacks only materialise when there's a tournament like the one that I organised yeah. in London in 2018. And that's where suddenly teams are tempted perhaps to let people into their yeah. team who maybe their roots are not 100% yeah. as solid. Or more likely, to be honest, teams make accusations of that yeah, because yeah, they're yeah. frustrated at defeats. Yeah. And it's really hard because under the FIFA rules, you can be like, well, yeah, that player's ineligible by that rule. Like, it's very simple to see what those rules look like most of the time in FIFA's rules. Like, there are weird ones and there are technicalities like um, Otis Khan couldn't play for Pakistan because I think his, or, or was banned for a bit because his grandfather was his route into nationality, but his grandfather wasn't born in Pakistan, but that's only because Pakistan didn't exist when his grandfather was wow. born. I think that was the thing. So it was like, yeah, he's from Pakistan, yeah, yeah, clearly. Yeah. But he, there, and so there are these little moments where FIFA rules get really weird, but Khanifa's rules are a nightmare because once you get to a tournament and people are like, they start to cry an eligible player, well, it's really hard to say if someone's from yeah. like an unrecognized state because it's not as It's kind simple. of not really celebrating like, the point of Kanifa, is no. it? Like I guess the only way to avoid that would for would be for Kanifa to get really stringent with the rules, which would then count out a lot of these sort of territories that you're allowed to play. And it's kind of what's what you're trying to achieve. Yeah. It's different if it's so interesting that you're involved in it because it, it combines so many things you've done previous, you know, it's like these these smaller nations or areas that aren't recognized or aren't ranked or whatever, also with this sort of humanitarian angle in a way as well, this kind of giving people a voice that they don't, or a unity they don't necessarily get through organised current football. So it seems like you're the perfect man to be there. <laughs> well, I was obviously. at the time. And in and 2018, I was at the final as well. I went to were, I, town. I mean, that 2018 spell was the, the craziest thing. And I never actually intended to be responsible for it. This was the weird thing. So I knew the Khalifa guys. I knew a couple of them. Um, and they were good, good people. I knew Sasha, who was the general secretary, German guy, who was like, absolutely worked like 40 hours weeks for free on Conif, like voluntarily. And he was like, he knew everything about the non-recognized world. So I said to him, what do you need? Like, what does Conifa need? Um, and he said, look, come along to AGM, see if you can help out. I went along to their AGM and they brought up, uh, the president brought up a slide of their financials on the board. And I had to like tap someone next to me. I was like, what? Wait a minute. This says they've got 400 euros in their bank account. And he's like, yeah, we do. I was like, w this organization that represents however many million people around the world has 400 euros. Like, I have 400 euros. <laughs> <You're laughs> Pretty dumb, much about that. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I could buy them out. Yeah. So, I was like, so I was like, so talking, it was like, what do you need? Well, the, what you need was pretty obvious. They needed a sponsor. Yeah. They ne and no one wanted to touch it because the, the, poli the political connotations. So mm. like, you sponsor this organization, you are basically putting your name behind Tibet. Mm. And then you are cutting any chance of doing business with China, potentially. You know, it's not definite, but you that could be an embarrassing conversation for a business. You're doing business in China and they're like, well, look, this is your name next to the Tibet logo. And you're like, that that can crash a business deal worth however much. So he said, like, no one wants to sponsor this organization. So was they it, was it Paddy Power in the end? Of step yeah. yeah, good old and, Paddy and Power. They was, don't mind taking people on, do they? This was why it was the funniest thing that, like, of all the brands and of all these weird things. So I went to this AGM, came back and I was like, look, no one wants to host your World Cup. No one wants to sponsor you. I was like, who sponsors stuff that nobody wants to sponsor? I was like, Paddy Power. Yeah. Like, I remembered the story of like how they'd intentionally got in a legal dispute with Pele just for the hell of it. Yeah. And I like, ended up paying them huge settlements just because they put Pele Power on loads of their stores without asking him. And then they just were like, oh, well, we'll just pay him. So I was like, they don't mind. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I contacted a mate of mine who, who worked there. Told him the whole story when I was like, I think I was pretty drunk at the time. I, was, I tried to outline all the intricacies of Kanifa football. And he's like, this is great. I love it. I won't remember it. Put it in an email. And so I did. And sure enough, like from this like first kind of drunken conversation, went all the way through meeting after meeting. And they they sponsored this tournament in London. They're like, that we'll do this tournament. It, it's got to be in London. Um, it'll be called the Kanifa Paddy Power World Football Cup. Yeah. We couldn't call it World Cup because you'd be no. sued, apparently. No, and, they own that phrase, yeah. And this was the thing. And so we had this, this thing of going through trying to find stadiums and sort of really consciously decided get non-league stadiums, like get proper like grassroots football clubs, especially if, if possible, like fan-owned clubs. Like we've got Enfield Town, yeah. amazing club. Yeah, um, played them on the weekend. Yeah, <laughs> I can't remember what the result was. I don't know if I should mention it or not. We, we, no, we drew three all. Oh, um, there you go. They were three one down as well. So we're quite oh, you're probably that, pretty yeah. happy with that. Yeah. But they, they were amazing and they have a big North, North Cypriot community up there. Yes, so do, yeah. that was also huge because they were like, can we host all the North Cyprus games? We're like, 
yes, like, this is amazing. And so one of our biggest games ended up being North Cyprus against Tibet. It was packed out of the QE2, like absolutely packed. Um, and they were like, everything were amazing. And But we were so bare bones, Conifer as a staff, like it was just about six or seven of us running this thing, all voluntary, uh, trying to run a like international football competition in London. And like it literally, was mad. They had all the flares out and stuff. It, they? Was, like, it was mad. We that to kick off at one point. That day where I turned up and there's like Tibetan dancing going on and North Cyprus flags everywhere, and I'm there in the stands and I'm like technically in charge. I'm just like I don't know what I'm doing. Mm. Uh, and we've got to play the national anthems, and I had them on my computer, so we we'd got them burnt and they were on my computers just like in iTunes. Like this is 2018. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm there. And we've hooked up my laptop. I don't know if it's even working. It's on the PA system and the players are lined up. The Tibetans are all there, like hands on their hearts. And I'm like, holy shit, press. And I press play. And thank God the Tibetan anthem came out rather than like whatever alphabetically was the next song on my iTunes, oh, right? Yeah. I was just like, this is the chance to cause the greatest offense in history. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, it worked. And it was the most nerve wracking moment of my life. But just to see these two, and they're literally crying because, you know, yeah. no, it's a this is like them, a yeah. huge thing to re represent their identity. And that day, that whole game was like an amazing dream just yeah. to see like the whole stadium alive with like color and excitement. And that was the real like high of doing that event. It was a great but, day. We, we made, I made a video about it on my channel. I sort of vlogged the game. Um, obviously, we played... We played in the build-up. I guess it was kind of like their preparations for the World Cup. Uh, we played um, uh, Punjab and we played Barua. Mm. And we drew with Barua and we beat Punjab. So that was like the end of our project because we'd beaten a country. So to yeah, speak, yeah. I mean, again, sort of the country in quotation marks. But uh, it was good enough for a YouTube title. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we conquered that. And then we went into non-league shortly after that. But, I mean, there's so many things you've done in football. Like We've not even touched half of it. What about um, uh, Kitmus? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, can I finish with my great Kanifa story? Oh, sorry, is, please do. No, just because it's yeah, so yeah. ridiculous and it shows how ridiculous this whole tournament was. So we were all, like I say, all volunteers. Nothing was properly like set. Like we were just doing everything on the hoof. We didn't know what we were doing. We we're doing our best. I was working like 14, 15 hour days trying to get this tournament to run. I was the cool person. If anything went wrong at a stadium, if there's like an injury or a, a problem, we had... um. We had a death threat called in on us for the Abkhazia game, and it turned out it was a like eighty year old woman, yeah. um, like who had posted a death threat in Facebook. And I was like, I don't know whether I should be scared. I couldn't see the profile picture, so I was like, I don't know. So I got to the stadium uh, for the Abkhazia game, and this woman's outside, and she's like, I messaged you, and I was like, the death threat, and she's like, Yes, I don't think this game should be happening. This Abkhazia is part of Georgia, and I was like, Look. I, I, I'm not going to argue with you, but I was like, thank God it's an eight year old woman who called in the death threat. And then she's like, but can I come in and watch? <laughs> so yeah, so there was this madness going on, right? And then on the final day of the tournament, we'd taken all our re all our revenue. We would just take the the gate take, the gate receipt. We'd just have an envelope from our like manager at each stage and we'd just bring it back to our hotel. I say hotel, is a hostel. Bring it back to our room and we'd just put it in a bag in the corner of our room. And it was on like the second last day that I was like, you know how we're going to pay all this into this bank account, Conifa's bank account? And they're like, yeah, 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 Swedish bank account, totally fine, just got to go to the branch. And I was like, yeah, there's no branch in London. And they're like, yeah, yeah, there is. There is. We phoned up the branch. They're like, we're just an administrative headquarters. You can't deposit money here. Like, this is like going into someone's office. You, we, we can't, you can't put this money in our bank. And I was like, what are we going to do with £36,000 in cash? Like, literally, in fivers and tenors. Uh, and so the head of Gleeful was like, okay, well, we're all going home tomorrow. So it's only really you who lives in the UK. Can you just put it in your bank account? And I'll give you a letter saying, this is all right. This is going to my organisation. So, tax and stuff, so yeah. like an idiot, I phone up HSBC in Edgware and I'm like, I've got quite a lot of money to bring into your account, uh, to your branch. Can I, can I deposit it? And the woman's like, yeah, probably be all right. Like, you know, be fine. Just come in. I'll, I'll make sure there's a like counter clear for you because it'll be more private. Get into the branch. Obviously, she's not found ahead. Go up to like one of the tellers and they're like, what are you trying to do? And I'm like, I've got a lot of money in this briefcase <laughs> and I want to put it in the bank. She's like, what? Because, you know, you can't hear no, through the glass. No. And, she, and so someone comes out and he's like, how much have you got there? And I was like, about £36,000. And he goes, £36,000. And the whole branch turns. Nightmare. And then I go into the, like they put me into an office with this bank manager and he's like, are you um are you a mule basically are you trafficking this money like are you um, money laundering sort of on are. behalf of someone and i was like no no it's Not totally valid yeah, yeah. and i was trying, trying to explain it i'm like i've got this letter and it's signed by the president of conifa and he's like what 
what are you talking? He's like, oh, I actually should call the police because you fit the profile of someone who's like mule, a mule to cash money, basically. Yeah, yeah, put, yeah. Because he's like, I can see your bank account. You do not have any money in your bank account. Why are you? <laughs> he's like, I cannot let you do this. It's it, it's like against all my ethics. I'm going to be like, I will not call the police as a favor to you, but tell your organization this is not cool. Like, do not do this. And he's like, and and yeah, you've got to go get out. So what is the answer? Doing it in lots of little bits? Or well, something? so what I did is I walk out with my briefcase in a branch full of people who have just heard uh, that woman yeah, yell 36,000. Nice I'm like, it's the longest ever wait for an Uber to arrive. I'll tell you that much. Jumped in. And what we actually did was we put it into um, a safe deposit box, right. um, which they always tell you do not put money into. Like, I think they're not responsible for it if it gets stolen. But I was like, it's either that or under my bed. <laughs> um, and slowly but surely, Kanifa people used to take it back in like little chunks whenever they would come to the UK okay. to keep it under the cash threshold. I think yeah, you're allowed yeah. to travel with like 8,000 or something. or right. But it got spirited away out of London. My God, those few days were like, Jeez. I was not. I was like, I can't go back to my flat with 30k in That's cash. Mad. That is mad, isn't it? <laughs> you don't anyway. think about these things. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, it's, it's getting less cash stuff now, but obviously non league is a lot of cash flying around and things like this. A lot of, you know, yeah, way players get paid and things like this has happened just traditionally how it's often been done. But, um, yeah, the ramifications there because you've got such a big tournament, all these big individual yeah. games that we've got into one bag. It's just can't imagine. I, we really thought we were just going to cash it. I thought I was just going to walk into a deposit, yeah. like deposit. In theory, it, you should be able to, shouldn't you? In theory, like should, I think, just... I think if you went into your bank, uh, into your bank now for a personal account and tried to deposit like thousands of pounds of cash, I reckon they probably would ask questions just because mm. it's. I guess because there's tax implications. It's yeah. like, why have you got 30K? But it just sounded so... Uh, I realised as I was halfway through explaining the letter, I was like, this is like a printed piece of paper <laughs> yeah. with a signature of a man you, you don't know from an organisation that isn't registered in this country. No, that's the thing, isn't it? With all like, due respect, Kanisa <laughs> sounds like something you could have just made so up. Made up. I'm, there. I'm there going, so we had Tibet and we had Abkhazia and this guy's just looking at me like, Oh no, mate! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> get out of here! <laughs> wow, I mean, yeah, tip of the iceberg. I'm sure I've got some lots, lots of other stories in there. But yeah, uh, Kitmus is something. I, I think I sent you some kits for it before. Mm. It's um, well, tell us about it because you, you and your yeah. brother do it, don't you? So yeah, tw- this was started about uh, I think 2020. I think it started in the COVID year, and I had um, I've been sending shirts around the world. You know, I, I, as I say, like my passion is is projects around the world that are doing good with football, and they're often struggling in various ways your kit is a big thing like people can't get kit in in loads of countries of the world so what i would do is send out bags of kit from my garage um nice people would donate stuff boots all kinds of things um usually second hand but, but good quality and i'd get them sent out all over the world um and it came into like christmas 2020 and i had like this really nice set of kits i can't remember maybe a chelsea or something that someone had sent and I just didn't have anywhere to send them at that time. The only place I was sending out to was a refugee camp, but we don't tend to send just like a few shirts because then it's like someone's got to pick 10 kids to get a brand new lovely yeah, yeah, shirt. Yeah. So we tend to either send in bulk, uh, you know, we, we don't do it that way, like, you know, 10 shirts. So I had these shirts and I was like, what am I going to do with these? Um, and basically put out a message saying, look, are there any community groups that think this might be nice for uh, parents to give to their kids for Christmas? Because it was like brand new shirts a lot of families going to struggle to give presents out at Christmas. And a lot of kids want these new, new, what well, the big thing is football shirts, isn't it? That's what I always used to want it. And yeah, yeah. they've got so expensive. Most families now can't do that. So I was like, look, try and donate them. And local community centre loved them. We're like, yeah, this is going to be amazing. So I just thought, look, just go on Twitter and just say, look, has anyone else got any shirts they want to give? And I'll distribute them to community centres. And the response was just crazy. It just went bigger and bigger and bigger. And that year I ended up getting given 2000 shirts wow sent them to community centers around the uk like 16 i think it ended up being different parts of the uk and they would then select kids families that they work with and distribute them to those families to give to their kids and um and this project's just grown and grown and grown year by year we've done four years of it now i think we've given away about six thousand football shirts um all over the place you know from glasgow to belfast to london to you know everywhere and, and the idea is we go through community groups, whether that's schools or food banks, and we we ask them what's needed, what age groups they're trying to fill. We send to them and they give out. But the bulk of what we do now is new shirts. So we get donations uh, on a kind of GoFundMe or from clubs themselves, and we donate new shirts because we were getting sent a lot of kits. <laughs> My yeah, postman yeah. knows me very well by now. <laughs> um, and we would get sent a lot. And 
we could use quite a few and it was really generous people but the whole point was to give these kids something and say look this isn't a cast off like you yeah, are yeah, yeah. this is the, we're not saying you are like second class in any way yeah. and yet if you give a kid a shirt that has even the tiniest bit of wear or it's old it's a few like too many years old or it's got a player's name on the back who's left or anything that would make that kid feel like oh i'm not sure about this we just wouldn't send those so those would end up going to africa and in the end we were like look it's much easier actually we just get donations buy new shirts get good deals with with companies like classic football shirts like mm. um, sports direct and buy in the best value shirts that we can but we always focus on like um neutral shirts we call them so like real madrid barcelona italy spain like a shirt any kid in this country pretty much will, will want yeah because it's too difficult otherwise you're like you don't want to send a man city shirt to a man united fan yeah, yeah but yeah. then if you start sending to community groups and you're like you've got these shirts to give out it just gets so hard for them to go in and be like have we got a chelsea fan have we got an arsenal fan yeah, have yeah, we got yeah. i mean obviously everyone's a hashtag fan so you know what's fly. crazy the other day this yeah. exist. so i actually did a little it's not for external use, but it's my family. James was here to help me with it, actually. I had my two nephews uh, sit down and we did like a podcast with them. They're like 10 and 8. And I got this idea from a guy called Theo Vaughn, this American comedian who did something similar with his. And I just wanted to do this moment in time conversation with them. Like I could show them back in 10 years and be like, look, these are the funny things you answered to these questions. But the reason I bring it up is... Uh, I, the eight-year-old is a good footballer. And I said, what do you want to be when you're older? He's like a footballer. Who do you want to play for? He said, oh, probably Al Halal. No way. That's what the eight-year-old oh, that is. Now. A, that, that is like, that's so what you're supposed to be. Al Nasser, actually, because that's who Ronaldo plays. Yeah, right. I'd, probably Al Nasser. I'd like to do a double toe. Al, oh, the Saudi Arabian team was like, yeah, hopefully. God, that right. is what sports that's, washing does, right? Isn't that mad? Isn't it, that mad? It is quite crazy. I, so I was thinking, and, it, and, and the reason I also bring it up is the teams, if you ask them who they support, they're like, oh, PSG. Yeah. Like, you know, Inter Miami, the other, the other cousin. And, that, and that's actually a change within our, like, like we're similar age, right? And, yeah. and it's, it's a change within our lives that... In the old days, you support a club, definitely like support a club. Player leaves, they're dead to you. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. now, a lot of the time, kids will follow players, right? I yeah. mean, not so much maybe with UK teams. Like, if, if a player, if they're an Arsenal fan and a player joins Man U, they're not going to join him. Like, no. like that's not how and it also works. English but, players until like, recently didn't used to leave England very much, did they? No, so exactly. Got and stuff, but, but yeah, Messi and Ronaldo, the two big ones. But that them. that's new, right? That idea yeah. that you like follow a player and suddenly because he's at Al. Al Nasser, you're an Al yeah. Nasser. That never would have happened when we were kids. It would have just been like, all right, bye then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, like, I used to like watching him play, but oh, he's gone now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, it's crazy. But yeah, the, I see what you're saying with the neutral kits. And I think you get it more and more. A lot of people have two teams now and they have like the England team or they have their Prem team. Most people that support local non league teams, they'll probably support a higher up team. It's like Spain, you know, traditionally everyone in Spain supports Real Madrid or Barca. Yeah. They also will support their local team as well, which could be anyone, you know, it could be Getafe, it could be Oviedo, whatever. But they'll still have an opinion because it's political, isn't it? It's like, you know, right yeah. wing versus the more liberal. I, I remember when I was in Italy, like someone said to me, you're either Juventus or you're not Juventus. Right. Okay. Right. And he's like, if you're not Juventus, like you can have another club, it's fine. But like, you're specifically like, you hate that club. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. real. It's really like partisan that's why we love way. it though isn't it that's why we love it oh yeah um i want to close it's been great like catching mm. up with you on this stuff i want to close the pod with a couple of questions uh first he sent it around your journey mm. so far like so when you came back from when you stopped doing the mongolian stuff are you still involved in the club in mongolia by the yeah way? i am actually i've just about to um to officially like I've, I've been in touch but i'm about to officially go back on their board in kind of oh, advisory nice. capacity so yeah. they're still a youth club still got really big ambitions still very much centered around like giving kids an opportunity to play yeah. but trying to also branch out into the countryside a bit outside of Ulaanbaatar because that's where the opportunities really dry up like right. almost all the population of Mongolia is in Ulaanbaatar if you actually look it's one of the world's least densely populated countries it might even be the top I, I'm not sure it's around there okay. but actually the city itself has got almost everyone in it and right. it is bustling and it is smoky and smoggy but actually out in the country there are like hundreds of thousands of kids who just don't have any chance so yeah and they're good at producing like mma fighters i've seen a lot of these guys yeah out there, like, well yeah. you know when Animals. i first went out there sumo this was the funny mm. thing so you'd have gossip mags you know like like a heat magazine or what if they have the i don't know what it is these days if it's still there but like sled mags and I, I open one up and it's just like sumo wrestlers all over and i was like who are these guys <laughs> it's like big, big they're the celebs yeah, right yeah. Mad. so but are you writing a book about that is that yes that's yes. right I'm, I'm writing a book this year um I think I'm going to call it a step too far. But I don't know <laughs> if that's too tacky. Um, but yeah, it, it's going to be about basically the the crazy series of events that led to me going there, setting up this team, and then 
weirdly been thrown into management of a team or yeah. ownership of a team from management. And um, yeah, I'm hoping to get that out this year if I can. Are you considering that like a sequel to Soccer Men? Or is it a separate project? Um, it's set, well, so yeah, well, so Up on Pay, the book came out in 2012. Yeah. Uh, and this will be sort of the next book that I've written, which right. is which is uh, weird. I've been doing a sort of sequel to Up Pompeii about what's happened since I left Pompeii. Okay. And that's on, um, I do that for the Patreon of The Sweeper. So the, the podcast that I do, I release it in installments on there. And it's like bringing you up to date with what happens um, after I left Micronesia. Got and it. it's quite a crazy series of events. I mean, one of them is that they lost the 46 nil in a, a game in the South Pacific wow. games. Micronesia did and why that happened, yeah, and how it back. happened. I know. And, and then all the way back to how I got back involved again and why. And under your watch, um, that would have been 40 nil max. I know. That's what I said to them. <laughs> I was like, no, I did, it was really frustrating because I offered them to get a coach in and I was like, I can keep the score down. But they were like, no, no, what do you mean keep the score down? I was like, you're playing Fiji and Vanuatu. Like you're playing serious players here. Have um, you seen the, because um, remember when I watched the, um, uh, what's it called? Dutch guy goes out to America. Let's go win. Let's go win. So obviously it made a, there was a documentary about that. Yeah. And then I was made an actual live action with like Michael Fassbender, <laughs> yeah. which is crazy. I haven't seen that, but I've seen the documentary. Like it does remind me a lot of what you did. I mean, yeah. it's obviously slightly different. He's a kind of more of a sort of known coach and there he's working with something probably a bit better facilities wise than what mm. you had to deal with. But would you see any part of you see that and kind of think like this is a bit familiar? Yeah, it was really funny. I mean, of all the things, like we did this project and then came out to the UK and one of the guys who made the documentary, that really lovely guy, got in touch and was like, have you just done this in Pompeii? And I was like, yeah, I've just been in American Samoa. And I was like, that is the weirdest coincidence. That's not a million um, miles away, is it? No, and the look of the place and the feel of it, the the rain and the the, the colours and the way it looks. And, and yeah, American Samoa is a really interesting one for me because it's like, to us, they were giants. They yeah. still are yeah. because they just do get those hundreds of thousands of funding each year from, right. from FIFA. And that's the big distinction. But it is an amazing story. Like, I don't know about the Hollywood version. If I'm honest, I'm quite cynical about the I mean, I was surprised. That. That's why I haven't seen it yet. I, think I was surprised it was made. I mean, the good thing about it, and this is me having not seen the film, so I'm mm. not judging it, but the, 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 the Hollywood version. But the good thing about it, I guess, would be that it will bring more people get more attention to the actual story and the yeah and the, that it would have in the documentary but. yeah it's not been a bad thing people are like oh you gutted about that and i'm like no not not really like it's actually bringing more people interested in, in like that part of the world yeah. um it probably did derail like when i wrote the book there was a feature film that kind of got sort of pushed around a bit and it could have happened and various like actors were named as potentially playing me I and that was all fun. Actual... yeah yeah so um there were they, it got to a various points and the funniest bit was hearing who they were lining up to be me at times um and i'd either be like oh, yeah of course that, that's a good choice like like incredibly good looking front man I'm like, yeah yeah and then sometimes it'd just be like a real nerd i'd be like well, are you sure about that? Can you name names or not? Can you, um, is, it still, is there still a chance it could be made, or is it? I don't. I don't think it will. Well, the thing is, so um, James Corden quoted on the book cover, like he, yeah. we got him the book. Um, my agent at the time, amazing agent, put the book in his dressing room when he was doing One Man Two Governors. Yeah. Um, and he re used to read it between uh, like set of sections of the play and be like, he loved this book. So he called me and said how much he loved it. And we always wanted to get him in to be Matt, who is my friend who, yes, who did this yeah, project yeah. with me. Um, and so then it was always about who's going to play Paul. And like, you could have had his sidekick from Gavin and Stacey because there's like, yeah, Matthew Hall, yeah, right? I mean, known as a pair. it was just funny, like, all the and I called never like he just suddenly got like incredibly famous yeah. and like it just wouldn't have quite fitted with him. And then he got a bit too old to be honest because we were 25, and even though he's very youthful looking, I don't think he passes 25. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, and then all these names got put around for Paul, and they they ranged from like. Yeah, quite funny ones. I mean, these people never signed up to do it, so I'm not like saying they said they'd do it. But uh, Simon Bird, the guy from the oh, Inbetweeners, yes, yes, yes. uh, he was the one who who <laughs> I thought actually was quite a good fit. Yeah, it, actually, I think he'd have been brilliant. And yeah. he's a really lovely guy as well. Uh, we I did actually meet him a few times and talk to him. He's lovely, like really nice guy. For, like got it and kind of I think he would have been quite up for it. But uh, yeah, just then obviously the next goal wins thing got huge, and it's like yeah. you don't really want to compete against a film with Michael Fassbender and yeah, it's true. but but there's a, there is a degree of relief you know I'm sure financially I would have been pretty happy but yeah there's a degree of relief because as soon as you sell your story they can do what they want with that yeah yeah. and yeah. there was always the worry that a film might take the piss out of someone yeah. or like it definitely would have even on a personal level it definitely would have had something like 
the Paul character cheats on his girlfriend, right? Yeah. Because that's just good drama. Uh, I can definitely say it never happened in real life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, you know, that's how you make uh, drama. Sure, and then suddenly everyone just believes that's right? true. Right, Be- because yeah. it's hard to say to people that thing you saw in the cinema, like, that wasn't true, that wasn't true. No. People will just take that to be the truth. And so I was almost quite relieved no one took it and did something with it because even something quite innocuous to the, the rest of the world might be for me like, oh God, you've just like really taken the piss out of that yeah, kid who yeah. I know and I really love and and now, I, you know. It, it kind of protects it as your story still in a yeah, way. Yeah, nice. exactly. It's sort of a win-win either way, isn't it? Like, it, 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 I see what you're saying about the challenges, but I think uh, more the more people hear the story, the more people will be inspired by the wider world. It's kind of like what FIFA say they try and do with the World Cup, you know, when they take it to places like South Africa and or whatnot, or Qatar more recently to try and grow the game. Mm. But for me, there's like the places that you're going to, and I know they do do some bits in the, the Guams or the wherever, get a little bit of money, but like football should be available for everyone. Like it should be something that has facilities and they, and they have yeah. the money to do it. We all know there's billions sitting in the bank account, right? At FIFA. So like yeah, yeah. there should be, what you tried to do and you took it upon yourself to do as a one man or you and your friend yeah. going out there like for no payment and just trying to create this football opportunity for players. Yeah, it's a great adventure, of course, but most people wouldn't do it. Let's be honest. Like you no. a big sacrifice for your time and money and things. There's, there's a huge, there's a huge governing body out there whose job is to do that. Yeah. And that that's the sadness for me is that like that doesn't happen. There's four, four countries in the world, four like recognized sovereign countries in the world that are not in a FIFA confederation and they are all, right next to each other in that area so right. federated states of micronesia marshall islands nauru and palau and they're all there in that region and on each of those islands there is there is interest in playing football it may not be high level at the moment it may be pretty informal kick arounds but there are kids and they want to play in theory there could be one day a gem of a player yeah who hasn't been found and won't be found because they haven't got the facility right exactly and and just what it could do for those like those kids who just don't have a lot of outlets in their lives and also for the most of east countries on earth oh, um, really yeah yeah, yeah really like because talk about all the americanization of, of everything coming over and, yeah, yeah a lot yeah. of junk food yeah. really hard like because there's not a lot to aspire to for like the young kids who are athletic there's not much they can do with that so yeah it's really sad to me that those nations are like still left out and there's a there's a there's not an obvious route for them to carry on um that said like i do think there's got to be a football tournament between those four it's got an amazing tournament right i think it sounds like it's got to happen yeah (laughs) was there ever a moment when you were like maybe post coming back from mongolia Mm. were you like cool can I do something in England now? Like, can I go and get a job, you know, use my CV? I maybe did go down that route. I don't know everything, but like, was there, how much of your kind of desire to make football your career and your, your time was because of that travel factor that came with it? And Yeah. I I think the travel factor is a big, a big aspect in it, but I also just don't think I fitted very well. So it's really interesting with you, with you and hashtags. I, I often looked at that as a project partly because we were in touch just before you did it yeah. and we were in touch in the early stages um and i remember just thinking at the time what an amazing project because it it ties you to something that can grow here and something that can be your vision and it was new and no one was doing anything like it and i was like what a cool thing to have ownership of and i think there was a period where i was like i wish i had something in the uk that i could pour my heart and soul into that was that fitted me but weirdly what's fitted me most is working with like people on the fringes and people yeah. who really and and the UK does have a lot of problems and there are a lot of problems in access to football and equipment and that that's kind of where Kitmus I guess yeah, scratches yeah, that yeah. itch. But in terms of where my skill set fits and my CV, it's always it's almost like the more the more remote places you go, you become skilled at working in remote places. Yeah, and then it's like well, okay, well London clubs or whatever Bristol in the world they want people that have been in that scene for 10 years. You exactly. Know? That it's a very closed shop, the UK, like for sure. It's a very hard place to get anywhere in football. I'd say it's really yeah. tough, but what is really nice in the way that the world's changed is it's got so much smaller for communication. When yeah. I was first in Micronesia, I could barely call home. I had to like, like hold my laptop underneath a massive, like internet antenna and pray it would connect. It was like that level. Now there's almost nowhere in the world. Like Micronesia's internet's fine. Like I can just call someone there. And it's changed a lot of things. Yeah. Like I can be on a call with someone in, you know, the far Pacific islands in the morning and Zambia in the afternoon and Mongolia in the evening. And it's, it's really nice because that has allowed me to continue living that, that, that sort of that wanderlust, like living that dream and yet not being separated from my family by, you know, 
9,000 miles, which, yeah. which I think at this point in my life, I just couldn't. But it's couldn't amazing that you did do it because so many people would have had that opportunity. I, I, I made a video, I say we wouldn't have had the opportunity, but if it had been presented themselves, would have said no. I had a video I made years ago on my channel um, where it must have been shortly after I read your book and I had an email, genuine email, I'll say genuine. It genuinely came through to me an email saying, we want you to be the next Togo National football manager. And bear in mind, Togo, they're not like, they're not like Pompeii. They're, they're like, you know, decent. Adebay all play for Togo. Yeah, like imagine suddenly coaching it's him. It's an email, literally, it was basically like one of those sort of, turned out to be one of those kind of fake, you know, scam emails. But yeah. it was just so interesting that it came to me and it was about being a football manager. And yes. I was like, hmm. so I kind of played a, the person sent here. I kind of had a dialogue with them and I made a video out of the emails back and forth. Yeah. It ended up being time wasting, but there was a few little things in there that made it sound real, like some links to certain LinkedIn's and Wikipedia's and things, you do a bit of research. Like, now this guy actually might be the guy that runs the Togolese FA. Why has he emailed my like Gmail account? Like, you... does he know that I like football? So I was like, it never transpired, but I was genuinely thinking, if this is real, would you do Would it? I go to Togo? And that's, I mean, I obviously would, because Togo, it's like, I mean, they've been Africa. You've been, 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 been AFCON, yeah. They've been all sorts. So, but, but you also yeah. get these weird things, right? So as we recently talk, um on actually on the sweeper on our podcast, we we spoke to this. Um, there's an a guy, Irish player who had Cape Verde heritage, right. and he's just been recruited because um, he got a LinkedIn message, but he ignored yeah. the first one because who gets a LinkedIn no, message I think I've read to call them up that. for their yeah, national football crazy. team, right? Yeah. So yeah, and it was in Portuguese, I think, and he was just like, who knows what that is? And it, so you do get these weird stories, right? And then Nathan Pond, who plays for Montserrat, and yeah. it was that they were bored on the team coach, and he's got. Montserrat Heritage and one of his teammates just literally fired an email to like Montserrat FA at Gmail or whatever it is yeah. saying I've got a hell of a player here why have you not called him up well, how and... do these people find them? that's what I always wonder like so we had a lad play for us last year Jermaine Francis he's just made his debut for uh, Gren Grenada mm. um, Sat Kassan who plays for us now he's got four caps for Somalia so like he'd already played for them before he played for us but I don't these guys that have like you know through a grandparent or whatever it is. I don't know how the people in charge of the FAs actually physically find yeah. a database somewhere. It's quite a new thing. So the database thing's really big now. Like there are people Even who do like this. Even for like non-league players. Yeah. And there are people who do this like um, as sort of almost external consultants who'll come into an FA. And there's there, a lot okay. of FAs now are looking more actively in the overseas diaspora. So Cook Islands, for example, I think now um, are really making a big push to see who have they got out there. And so there are people who go around and just scour and scour. And I don't exactly know how they do it. They must they must have amazing research skills. Yeah. But it's quite a big thing now to be like, especially for these lower ranked nations, perhaps, or nations that feel they could be higher, to be out there like saying, our player pool domestically is quite small. But yeah. wait a minute, there's going to be you know, thousands potentially of talented players. Well, look at players countries like there. Jamaica, like their best 11 they can put out now with some of the guys that they've got to pledge their national uh yeah so like antonio obviously more recently from west ham started doing it like they got an actual real proper side and if yeah. they were just going to people born in jamaica that i mean we've all done it england won the world cup with like you know um I forget his name now the south african guy playing in the middle what's his name i don't know but half the team wasn't from england do you know what i mean Cric oh, cricket yeah. as well we've oh done yeah it. yeah you know our captain and, and i don't think like i definitely don't have any moral aspect because identity is is complicated like identity yeah. is about you know if your parents are from somewhere if your grandparents are from somewhere that'll be part of your identity yeah. so i don't have a problem with that well, jack greenish and declan rice right. both played for ireland yeah they right we, england, yeah. but i do think what's difficult then is the domestic leagues i do think that there's always that um tension so tanzania called up five uk non-league players for their afcon squad and that's amazing you know it's lovely to see it um but also actually when i when i tweeted that out and it's like it's really cool to see that a lot of people quite understandably were like, actually, it's it's really bad for the domestic Tanzanian yeah, players. Yeah, yeah. It's saying to them, you're not good enough. Yeah. You haven't actually had a chance. So I, I, there's always going to be that like battle between the two sides. Yeah, and yeah, I don't yeah. think there's a right or wrong. You need but... the player coming in to be a level up. You need yeah. It's kind of like sort of equal opportunities of employment. It's the same thing. Like if you're going to give it to someone, they've got to be next level. Otherwise, they've got to be. Yeah. But also, I guess they come in with that experience of like, you know, you, you've played in an English setup. It's going to yeah. be a decent professional level. So you are coming in and showing in training, you're going to inspire a lot Make of everyone those. Else better, yeah, yeah. So I, I think, you well, know. Well, Tanzania aren't doing that good a job because if they did, <laughs> they would know that Faisal Man's Dog Manji, the first ever goal scorer for Hashtag United, is eligible for Tanzania and they haven't called him Didn't up. Didn't get so the call. Maybe outrageous. that's why their coach got sacked mid-tournament. Definitely uh. is. It definitely is. <laughs> right. Final question. Um, you have been, you know, in and around a lot of teams. You've like done pretty much all the different jobs as well. You've coached mm. teams, your own teams, like all these things. You've seen how they do it in all these different countries, probably more than anyone else I'll ever have sitting opposite me mm. in terms of the, the different places you've gone to and cultures. What are your key 
pieces of advice for me and for anyone else running a club that you think are just non-negotiables if you're going to have a good club you need to do this god that's a that's a really tough question and, and as i say i don't feel equipped to give answers to people especially somebody running a much more successful club than i ever ran like well, i'm just so it would be hard to advise you, you like you must um, if you went and say a new project came along tomorrow mm, and it was yeah. in i don't know bloody it could be anywhere with you couldn't it? it could literally yeah be really good tasmania or somewhere yeah right? and they're like want you to work on 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 our team you must have some things that you've seen that you know okay we can't do it like this. We can't do it. You've learned that hard. You've learned for experience. Maybe if we're getting it wrong, like we all do, you know, yeah. like, and what is, and it might not be about on the pitch. It might be about, okay, who the person that runs the club has to think this way or, yeah, you yeah. know, you need to do this for the fans, whatever. Like for me, it's always community. Like community is, is, is the football club. Like a community for you, it's really interesting because your community hails from all over the place. Yeah. Like you're almost a unique club in that sense. But for me, it was always about, um, how does this club relate to and help the people around it like you if a club for me feels like it's a it's operating for the owner and it's not about the people around then I, i'm not interested in getting involved yeah, in that yeah, yeah. For the projects that always get me are like where a club is is ingrained in that community and and that community gets pride from it and there's yeah. a sense of that being like you are not just going to be part of a football club you're going to be part of this whole place, this, these people, the, this town, wherever it is. And so I'll always be excited by a project where you can see there's that relationship. And that's, that's the clubs that I really admire in this country as well. There's always a sense of like, they have a vision and they're engaging with people and they are doing something that goes beyond the football field. It's like, this is, a, this is giving a sense of like worth and identity. So for me, that's all, that's always a, that's always a sign to me. If I get excited by, what I'm engaging with beyond the football pitch, then I'm then I'm starting to think, oh, okay, this is a club. Mm. I, I will never want to work somewhere where it's just an ego project. For no, and I think I, I mean, we need to get you down to hashtag game because I think that in the first few years of hashtag, whilst we always had that a vision of creating something, we were just you know a, a group of mates playing on YouTube. There wasn't that. But once we went into non-league, we sat down in a room and we really said, what is our what is our kind of ethos, if you mm. like? And we looked at clubs like Dulwich Hamlet, we played recently, and the things things they do with sort of uh inclusivity and and uh and anti-fascism all this sort of thing that really on a personal note links to my personality that i wanted to bring mm. through in hashtag so i think what we have is this sort of duality at hashtag where if you come to a game you'll see it is built around an actual family which is my family then we have our local community since we merged with a youth team women's team you know we have we have uh disability teams we have inclusivity teams we have walking football teams we have everything now pretty much every kind of football team you can have we have and they are in an area of the world, despite our name being non-geographical. Yeah. They are in this part of Essex. We we don't have a way yet. And we do have an online community, clearly, that watch our videos and we try and do things we can do online with them. But we don't really have a way of doing both at the same time. We kind of, And I think as we grow or as we get older, I think we have to sort of lean into one more than the other. And it's kind of making that choice. It might be one day merging with another club or, or changing our name slightly to put a geographical place into it, which hasn't been really necessary yet. Mm. And I think the name is part of the, the success of hashtag, but that would lean into that more non-league community stuff you're talking about. Yeah. But then equally we are like a, we are an internet team that is a community. They just live in different places. Yeah. Sometimes these guys come to our game and they say, you know, I've been watching you for three years from Australia and I feel like when I come here, I know you all. In, in a way, isn't that what's special about it? Yeah. Isn't it something quite special about there being a club where kid could be sat in India and it's his, his football team? Could Kid could be sat in Australia, it's his football team. Like, I don't know, in a way, that's your that's your USP. That's, yeah. that's kind of what's special. Because when I say community, I kind of, I would include that in community. It's, it doesn't have to be like the community of a town. It's mm. just got to be a sense of identity that a group of people feel expresses them. And I, I think... Yeah, you've got a very difficult situation because of that, I suppose. Is there a limit to how far you can go while maintaining that? I don't know. I'm not really placed. Well, I think that the things that would enhance our club financially are the things that normal non-league clubs do, like owning a ground and all those things. They tie us to a place and they, they're they good for sustainability, but they might they might slightly hinder the other side of the club, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Whereas if you're just growing and you're basing everything around keeping people on the internet happy and views, the kind of... There's no ceiling where we can go. It's very exciting in terms of chats you might have with investors and things. You, if you play into that yeah. side of the club, it gets really interesting, but you're probably, you might have to be open to, for example, move into a different part of the country if an investor wanted you to, which is completely yeah. against the local community. So you, you've got what's best for hashtag. You've got what appeals to me as a football man. You've got what the football 
love in public, look down on and don't like, you know, famously, obviously, MK Dons, also Wimbledon going to AFC Wimbledon. It doesn't really happen in England, men's game at least. So all these things you have to think about constantly. But listen, I love your story. I love your journey. Um, I, I, maybe won't, maybe there won't be any, you know, far-flung adventures in the future, but maybe there will. You never know. I feel like it's, it's open-ended with you. But The Sweeper is your podcast that is... Is, is out, it's available. Yep. We're going to put links in the description. We'll put links to like Kitmus and stuff as well. And there's anything else you want in there because listen, everything you, you do is interesting to me. And I think um, it's really why I love football, like the universality of the sport. So everything you've done in your time is just exactly what I like. So keep doing these well, adventures. Same, same. Like it's, it. it's pretty inspirational to see where you're at now, like checking in with you eight years later, right? And um, eight where more years, be, where Champions League. Yeah, <laughs> it's got well, to be, it? Theoretically, it is possible. I'll, we'll be in the San Siro, right? <laughs> Imagine. Oh, they probably knocked it down. But yeah, yeah we'll, be, we'll, be, we'll be at Real Madrid. We'll be we'll, at the we'll do a 16-year <laughs> reunion from the original <laughs> one, see where we are. But yeah, thank you very much, Paul. The best for the future. And uh, yeah, I hope you enjoyed this episode, guys. <laughs>